schmutz, dirt, or a similar unpleasant substance. We're really reaching here. We're, we're entering Yiddish territory. We're really reaching here. I will now present my incredibly cynical take on that Rebecca Black Friday uh, hyperpop remix that she did with Dorian Lecture and Dylan Brady and stuff. My take that no one asked for. Uh, it's shit. It's bad. And here's why. It's the beat for most of the song is literally just a kick and a donk with pitched up vocals on it. Um, now, you, this is like so minimal and bland and basic. Like I could literally make the beat in five minutes or less. It's that simple. The donk is a preset in Logic. It comes in Alchemy. It's called Deep Techno Bass. I've used it. I used it on Made, in, uh, Made of Blood. I, like it's, it, I used it in my... Um, uh, a remix of that 80s song I did, uh, the Supreme song that I deleted because I didn't like it. Like, it's it's a preset in Logic. So literally all Dylan Brady did was grab a kick, grab the, a Logic preset, and that's fine. Like, just because it's easy to make doesn't make it bad. Uh, but I just have a feeling that no effort or thought was put into it because, like, okay, so it's almost, like, reminiscent of some of the, like, early PC music stuff. Like, let's say Hey Cutie, for example. But the difference is Hey Cutie is effective pop music. It's like a great, it has an amazing chorus, like the hook, Hey Cutie, yeah, yeah, some things I want to say. Put your hands on my body every time you think of me. But I haven't listened to that song in literally like over a year probably, and I still remember the hook because it's got a fucking killer hook. It's it's effective pop music, even though it's super stripped down and minimal and it's decontextualizing itself from pop music to make you look at it in a different way and see a different angle to pop that you haven't seen before. But not so with this song. It's just Friday with a donk on it. Um, Friday doesn't isn't a good song. Friday was famous for being a bad song. Uh, so putting a donk on it is just saying, ha-ha, I know it's a bad song now, ha-ha. Look at, look at me, it's pissing in the middle of the street and then saying, well, look at me, I'm pissing in the middle of the street. And then everyone saying, well, at least he knows what he's doing. <laughs> that's not, mm, no, uh, that's, you're still pissing in the middle of the street. I stole that metaphor from some YouTube video. I don't remember what YouTube video. Uh, uh, the, the, then it's almost like Deconstructed Club, right? But again, it's not minimal enough or interesting enough to be deconstructed club. What's it deconstructing? Nothing. It's just reproducing. It's not deconstructing uh, trub, club tropes. It's just reproducing club tropes in a really bland and boring way, but presenting them as if they're interesting, but they're not. Uh, there is a genre of music that is mostly just kicks and donks, and it's really fucking good, and it's called Russian hard bass. And that shit fucking bangs you know we all Tripalovsky, Tripalovsky. we all love hard bass i've played enough csgo you know everyone hard bass is like a universal fucking um language no matter where you are in csgo if you say Tripalovsky, Tripalovsky, everyone will join in everyone will be everyone will love it hard bass is an international language because it's just genuinely good music that's never going to happen with this fucking friday remix because it's too wrapped up in itself it's too wrapped up in its own ass but not in a good way and I would, you know, you might think I would say, and I'm, that's why I'm happy that the video has so many downvotes on YouTube, but I'm not happy about it because I know all these people are disliking it for the wrong reasons. They're only disliking it because it sounds bad, but it doesn't matter that it sounds bad. It's that it sounds bad in the wrong ways. If it sounded bad in the right ways, then it would be, then, then, you know, it would be a good song, but it sounds bad in the wrong ways. And so they're just liking it just because it sounds bad, not because it sounds bad in the wrong ways. But, like they would, they would still dislike it if it sounded bad in the right ways but it doesn't sound bad in the right ways it's been long enough now that i can get back into lo-fi hip-hop i was into lo-fi hip-hop back in the day so heavily specifically bsdu which i didn't find out was which i literally thought was a reference to the operating system bsd obviously it turns out it's actually uh bes beside you which Plunder told me. I thought it was I thought it was BSD dot U, some sort of reference to computer. Anyway, 
the BSDU Late Night Bumps makes tape. The original one on YouTube isn't there anymore, I think. And maybe it still is. Maybe that's the one, but I feel like it was a different one. Anyway, uh, the original one. Man, it's so cool. Such a cool thing. Um, like, most, most, I think the reason I, firstly, lo-fi hip-hop got way too oversaturated. Like, everyone was using lo-fi hip-hop in their YouTube videos, people, they still are. Like, it, it was everywhere. It was oversaturated. Like, crazy. Because it's so easy to make. Like, I, I made a lo-fi hip-hop beat every day for, like, months. That's how I started on Akazi. That's how I built up a lot of my early Akazi followers on SoundCloud because I would just make a lo-fi hip-hop beat every day. And it's super, super easy to make. You can make one in, you can make like a good one in an hour. If you're taking it slow and taking your time, it can still, it'll still take an hour max. Like it's, it's a really chill thing. And it's kind of fun still as a producer. I don't do it anymore because it's too simple for me. Like, kind of boring to the point where it's that simple um but uh you know when i was still starting out it was fun but either way lo-fi hip-hop became way too oversaturated and um cliche so i stopped listening to it and i kind of rejected it and rightly so because most of it is really really boring and shit but there's like some this early beside you tapes especially the first uh two Late Night Bumps mixtape volumes are like masterful sample choices and drum choices. Like seriously good. Even and the third one as well. The fourth one I don't like as much. It's a bit more trap trap influenced. I don't think lo-fi hip hop works well with trap. I think it works much better with nineties style boom bap type stuff. Not the half time trap stuff. Um but uh but yeah, it's it's really, really good. Uh and it's very, it's very minimal. It almost reminds me a bit of like, I don't know what it reminds me of, but it's, it's definitely nice. It's, it's, it's a, it's good, good to smoke too. Not that I smoked weed in ages, but I remember smoking loads of weed listening to this fucking playlist or mixtape. Uh, it's very good. It's great to freestyle over as well when you're stoned.
I tried to make a punk song today. I tried to make a punk song today. And uh, every sort of punky chord progression I could come up with just sounded so corny and bad. I tried, like, I don't know. I don't know what I did. I heard a good song today called... um, I forgot something about being a neat. I forgot. But, uh, and I was like, I'm going to make punk music again. I tried to make, like, some more straightforward punk stuff. And then I was like, maybe I should try and make something like To the Fairest. I don't think I can ever make To the Fairest again. Like, I genuinely don't. None of the production of that album is, like, in my memory at all. I don't remember making it. I, like, now that I think about it, I genuinely don't remember making any of it. I'm, I literally don't remember making it. I, I literally don't remember how I did it. Like, I know theoretically what I did, but I just don't remember how I did it. I remember making other songs. I remember making my 100 gigs remix, for example. I remember, or I remember parts of it. I remember making other stuff. I have no recollection of making to the first. I know I did it, <laughs> obviously. But I don't remember making it at all. I don't know how I came up with those melodies and stuff. No idea. I remember telling my friends about it and talking about it and releasing it and making the album art and stuff. I remember making um, the final song, Learned Helpless. I remember making that, but I have no memory of making any of the other songs on that album. I have a very vague memory of making Sit Tight, but I have no idea how I made the other songs on that album. And I definitely don't think I can never do it again. Which is fucking weird. It's fucking weird. Uh, yeah, I I ended up making like a weird fucking like ambient noise song instead. But I tried to make a punk song. I ended up transforming into like a weird. First, it transformed into like a weird sort of like I don't know doom gaze type of song, and then that turned into like. I was just like experimenting with reverb and I ended up turning that into more of a, a, a an ambient noisy shoegazy song rather than like a metal-y shoegazy song like a, the, it's still noisy but it's more like comfy kind of noise than like in your face killing you type of noise which is something I appreciate um, more like a hyper bloom EX type of noise rather than a go 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 type of noise you know which I think I want to explore more but um I just I I'm not sure like I have a lot of stuff I need to figure out like do I even want like I, I thought about adding vocals to it I recorded some vocals and then I deleted them I recorded some very different vocals that are more like a choir type of effect and I deleted those um like none of it's not that. Maybe just keep it super minimal. Maybe I should, my next non thank you release just be some sort of like super minimal, noisy stuff. That'd be kind of sick. I don't know. I I don't have a sense of identity for no thank you at all anymore. Like I've I really overthought it as a whole thing. It's it's no longer just oh I make music that sounds good and I can put it as an album. Like, I've really overthought No Thank You way too much, and nothing I make sounds comfortable anymore. I want to talk about the funniest thing I ever did. So, one night, I decided to get really drunk. And while I was really drunk, somehow, I think probably I was watching YouTube. I don't remember, really, if this is what happened. I don't remember anything. But if I had to guess, if I had to literally reconstruct my own life like a crime scene, the timeline aligns that this would have been around the time that Sewer Slut was in everyone's recommended on YouTube. 
And so I, while really drunk, decided to make this song, this breakcore song on my Akazi account called Fuck to a Slut, Real Motherfucking Deli G's. And now I do remember this because I had listened to Real Motherfucking G's earlier that day, uh, which is a great song. And so I made this while just so drunk. I was, I can't overstay how drunk I was. I decided to just throw together this breakcore song and just put it out as a Sewer Slut diss track just because I thought it was the funniest shit you could possibly do. I put no effort into this breakcore song. Like, if you listen to it, compared to my other breakcore songs, it's way less complex and so on and so on, right? Like... I, I and, and no one understand the joke. I even put cunt corner the Dorna in the fucking picture for no reason. And everyone thinks I'm serious. This guy thinks it's because Suicide like, tweeted the N word. I don't give a shit. None of this like so many comments. So many comments. Of people who think this is that I give a shit. Listen, I dislike Suicide's music. That's it. I don't like that Suicide's a fake ass bitch. That's all I don't. That's that's the thing. I don't like that Suicide's a fake ass normie ass bitch intruding on my fucking property. Suicide is a cultural imperialist of autism, mate. But the song itself is a joke, and none of them realize it. And every so often, I just get comments either hating on me or agreeing with me, both of which are hilarious. It's very good. It's very funny. Very good time we're having over here on the Akazi SoundCloud account. I should make more break code, to be honest. But yeah, this is a very funny song. Um, a whole very funny circumstance. Like, can you can you not tell that it's a joke due to fucking daughter in the cover? And the fact that it's called Real Motherfucking Deli G's? Whatever. They don't even know what Delhi means. None of them even go on 420 chan. None of them matters. Because it's like... I don't know. I don't know. It's funny. It's, I thought you might want to hear about some of it. Because it's, it's quite funny. Uh, let me see if I can find some of these comments. Drama. Suicide got fucking cucked and groomed by Twitter. Sewer Slut is Queen. Sewer Slut bringing dumbass and 100 Gex and softy shitheads into the breakcore community. Those motherfuckers corny, bro. I agree that shit's trash. I agree. Okay, but she's been real quiet since this came out. <laughs> it's because she keeps whining on the Twitter breakcore drama. Hilarious. Woo! Yeah. Woo! Yeah. Breakboard this track. I don't know. I find it very funny. I need to do more stuff like that, to be honest. I take myself too seriously sometimes. So I just watched this newest Nexpo video. Now, Nexpo is a channel that I kind of hate watch. Like, I don't really like his videos at all. In fact, I find them very annoying, especially recently. In this video, there were dramatic pauses so long that I checked if the video was still playing. I literally checked if the video had paused by accident because he pauses between the... But the two boys would never be seen again. Like, stuff like that. Like, just ridiculously long pauses for no reason. Anyway, the story... Don't worry about this. I just need to vent, right? These guys went missing in the woods. It doesn't matter, right? But, and it's like, oh, but why was he found dead in a cabin that had enough canned food to allow them, all of them to survive for months, uh, where they'd clearly broken into a window and made no attempt to patch the window up, and he had died from starvation when they had right next to a bunch of canned food, and he had had severe frostbite, you, but they had made no attempt to patch up the window they broke into. Like, whoa, what mysterious circumstances could have happened here? Well, he forgets the fact that they literally all were had severe, had had learning difficulties. They all were mentally disabled, except for one guy who was schizophrenic and uh, medicated, but presumably didn't have his medication on him. Uh, 
They were just too retarded to survive. That's literally all it is. A bunch of retards got lost in the woods and then died because they were too retarded to figure out how to eat. Like, I'm sorry. That, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, but that's the truth. That's so clearly the truth. <laughs> what, is that disrespectful? I don't know. But, like, that's so clearly what happened. So I'm watching the newest Dotes Mate video. Um, by the way, if you aren't subscribed to Dotes Mate, if you like my videos, you'll definitely like her videos because we're basically the same person. The best way to describe me and Dotes Mate's relation to each other is that we're the same conclusion to completely different questions. In the same way that you can get to the number three by doing one plus one plus one, or by rounding down from pi, but you end up at three. That's me and Dotes. Go sub. But in her newest video, called Young Dotes Might in Losing My Smarbles or something like that, I forgot. Um, she's, she's showing her room at her apartment to two rooms she shows one room and then she walks through a doorway this is me opening a door right she walks through a doorway i'm not opening that door there's people out there it's horrible it's horrible the situation really she opens the door she goes into the other room she says and this is my other room and then there's nothing else there's nothing beyond this and when she says that you can see a window in the corner and because of how dark the room is and the, the uh, contrast on her camera the window just looks like it's pure white. Like, there is literally nothing beyond it. Like, that's the entire universe. It's a fucking amazing world. I don't think it was on purpose. I don't care. It was... It's amazing. She's like, I, I walk in here, and here's my other room, and there's nothing beyond this. And then you just see the void, the actual pure just void beyond the fucking room. Like, literally, this is the entire world. There is nothing else. There is literally nothing beyond this. There is no thought that can transcend beyond this. The only thoughts that are capable of happening take place in this fucking two-room space that I live in. That you can't even conceptualize of something outside of this. There is nothing beyond it. <laughs> Something pretty fucking crazy is happening today, uh, and I'll get to that. But to, to get there, I need to rewind and talk about something that I'm amazed I've never mentioned on the channel before. I have agoraphobia, right? Now, in the wild, I've seen three different definitions given for agoraphobia. Some people say it's, it's when you have anxiety about getting anxiety. So, so your anxiety gets so bad that you start freaking out because you think, oh no, what if I have a panic attack? That's one thing. I used to have that a lot. Nowadays, I don't have that, that anymore. But that's one thing people have said. But the other two definitions is number one, a fear of open spaces. That's like the most common one. It's like the opposite of claustrophobia. It's a fear of open spaces. And the other one is, no, no, it's, it's the fear of a place where you escape isn't easy, where you can't escape. Now, I have both of these to differing degrees. Um, so I, especially in the past when my health anxiety was worse, it was always worse on the tube. Because I imagined if I had, remember, my health anxiety revolves around uh, dying suddenly of a heart attack. Um, and I imagined if my heart stopped in the middle of the tube, because remember, I, being outside in general, it's, it's a feedback loop. So being outside in general is scary to me because of my agoraphobia, right? Because open spaces and surrounded by lots of people and blah, 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 that's a terrifying experience. Then going down underground into the literal bowels of the city inside a tube train. Now, I love the tube. I think it's a fucking great. Like, I, I'm a, I love it from an intellectual perspective. Like, I love the way trains look. I'm a big fan of trains. Everyone knows this. I like, I like my trains. I like my rolling stock. I think the tube, the, the, the tube in London is a great place. Like, it, it, as in, in terms of it looks cool and it feels cool. The oldest underground network in the world, you know, it gives a vibe to it. Um, and it's a masterpiece of, like, um, uh, d design, like visual design and... Uh, uh, like the, it's actually very difficult to get lost in the tube, which is amazing because it's such a complex network of stations and trains and platforms, and you know it's very rhizomatic in that sense. But it's almost impossible to get lost because the signing is so good and everything. Sorry, I'm nerding out about the tube. <laughs> you see, I really like the tube, right? I think it's a great fucking place. But it's also terrifying, and particularly when I was on the way to school or work on the tube. 
I was also dreading the fact and having anxiety about the fact that I would have to be, I was on this place that was scary already just to get to a place that was even worse. So that was awful. That was just generally fucking terrible. And then I would start, so then my heart was beating, right? Because I'm anxious, my heart would start pounding. And so I'd be like, and then I'd start freaking out about my heart. And I was on the tube and I was like, if I have a heart attack while I'm in the tunnel, I'm going to die because I won't be able to get to a hospital. And th that was fucking scary. I've had that, that exact thought loop that I just described to you is a very familiar place for me. I've probably had that exact thought pattern uh, at least 50, 100, 200 times. Like, that was an everyday experience for me. No matter how many times I did it, it still felt new because there's always the thought, but what if this time? But what if this time it's real? Which is just the worst. <laughs> I don't envy anyone. I mean, I don't wish this upon my worst enemies, right? But then the other one is the fear of open spaces. Now, this is the one that's actually, I never used to have it, but it's now it's a thing. <laughs> like, the fear of not being able to escape places, that was one thing. But the fear of open spaces, um, I only got this relatively recently when I hadn't been outside of my room for ages. And I would describe it as, as a Lovecraftian fear. <laughs> I don't know if this is how other people experience it. But it's to, I'm basically terrified of the sky. <laughs> I know, my brain is fucked. <laughs> my brain is just fucked. Because if I start thinking about the sky, I just start thinking about how it never, it never stops. Like, you can look up, and you can't see the edge of it, because there is no edge of it. It's just the infinite universe. And I just fucking... And I can't stop thinking about it. I can't stop trying to conceptualize the infinite <laughs> every time I'm outside. And so I'm just fucked, because I, I, I'm, I'm just trying to conceptualize the infinite, which is impossible. I'm trying to... I'm, I'm trying to look beyond the sky. <laughs> I literally, this is how fucking retarded I am. I can't go outside because when I see the sky, I start trying to imagine the entire universe. And that breaks my brain. And I can feel it pushing down on me, basically. Like, I can feel, like, above me is literally everything, or, like, half of everything. Basically. Like, above me is an entire fucking weight of an entire infinite universe. Light years and light years of distance and planets and stars and black holes and quasars and neutron stars and everything is all... And the sky itself is so big. Like, when I look at a, a building, I can see the building and I can be like, oh, that's kind of far away from me. Like, that's a, maybe, you know, a mile away from me or something. Or even if it's far away, like, oh, that's maybe a mile away from me. When I look at the sky... I, I'm like it's so big, it's so big, and I feel like it's all. Why is it all above me and around me? And it's like it's, it's very scary. But it's also kind of, if I'm in the right frame of mind, I can. It's kind of exhilarating. Like that's what's interesting is that feeling like you're gonna die from a heart attack is never fun. But feeling like you're surrounded by the infinite universe, like feeling like you feeling that um, the sublime power of the universe, the sublime scale, right? Being face to face with the sublime scale of the universe can be like, it's scary always. It's never not scary. But if I'm in the right frame of mind, then it's like, not, I can deal with it because I can just start thinking about it as like cool rather than terrifying, um, which it is cool. Like it's always kind of cool, but it's also like, it's in the way that, like, you might watch a movie where you watch the protagonist uh, in a very dangerous situation. Uh, like, for example, I don't know, take take a, any action movie, right? Take take a uh, what's the, uh, the, 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 the Die Hard. Okay, Die Hard is a really good movie. Everyone loves Die Hard, even though it's a bit weird politically, but it's a great movie. Um, right, and you think that. Um, whatever his name, the main character, is in a really cool situation. But can you imagine how terrifying it would be if that was actually you? Like, no one would ever actually want to be in that situation, but it doesn't stop it from being cool. The same, that's how I see the world. <laughs> no one would ever want to be in th that situation. No one would ever want to be alive, but it's kind of cool. And so because of that, there we go, I've explained my agoraphobia. And right now I'm in the mood where... I can 
do that. I can face up to the coolness of it and minimize the scariness of it. Like I can sense it in my brain that I'm in that mood. And I'm going outside today for the first, and I'm going outside on my own volition because I need to buy a new vape. This vape is fucked. I've had it for like four years. It was cheap when I bought it. It's just broken now. It's just completely fucked. It barely fucking works. I have to charge it twice a day because the battery is so fucked. It, it shouldn't. It should need charging like once a week. But I need to charge it constantly. It's bad. But also, more, most importantly, it's circular. It's cylindrical, and so it just rolls. It rolls everywhere. And if it falls over, it rolls everywhere. And this thing is fucking broken. The top just comes off like super easily. So it, it falls down, and then the top comes off and rolls somewhere under the fucking desk. And I have to get down on my. It's terrible. It's just an awful situation. So I'm buying a new one. And that's what we're doing today. We're going outside and buying a vape. And for at least part of the journey, you'll be coming with me. Uh, yeah, I'm going to get dressed as well. I'm not going to actually, for once in my life, I'm not going to go out uh, dressed like I am right now. I'm going to actually wear clothes. <laughs> um, which should be fun. I get to show off my epic clothes been a while since I've shown off my epic clothes, my my Denver fashion. Give me a chance to show you my outfit. I'll show you when I get back. Cut my thumb open. Fun time. On my way to the bus stop. I uh, have to buy a new vape. Got my mask on. Everything's cool. Hopefully I didn't miss the bus. Uh, lovely weather out. <laughs> no, that was a joke. The sky above me is the color of a television tuned to a dead channel, as they say. Any, yeah. It's very annoying. It won't stop bleeding. It doesn't hurt or anything, it's just bleeding everywhere. I keep having to wipe it on my fucking hoodie. Ambulance! Give me a plaster! Give me a plaster, please. <laughs> Alright, I made it. I made it to Brixton. Now it's time to buy a vape. Uh, I made it just in time. There was so much traffic. It was ridiculous. Uh, but. Hopefully I should still have enough time to get to the store and buy what I need to buy. <clears throat> I, uh, I've realized a few things, but I can't explain them. Where are we going? I hope my phone doesn't run out of charge before, you know, I guess some some of that good footage. That's what it's all about, really, that good footage. I hope uh, you don't think me videoing that schizo, right? So there was some guy shouting on the bus, just shouting random nonsense. Uh, it was quite funny. And, uh, Hold a second. I realized that holding your phone out in the middle of Brixton High Street is the world's easiest way to get robbed. So that's why I waited. Um, halfway through recording that, I was like, someone's gonna snatch this out of my hand. So, uh, someone gave me this. The battle for your soul. I hope my soul's okay. I haven't been paying much attention to that guy lately, so. I hope my soul's doing fine. Uh, there's a battle for it, apparently. That's kind of cool. Anyway, we're approaching the vape shop. I'm not going to record inside. I feel that's a violation of people's privacy. And it's closed. So, we're not going to that vape shop. Fortunately, I know there's another one somewhere around here. But that's a fucking shame. Uh, I think there's one down this street. Somewhere. Yeah. Oh, there it is. I see it. All right. Well, that's enough recording for today. The other one's closed too. They're all closed. What the fuck? I don't know. I think there might be another one, but 
I don't know where it is. I'm gonna have to look it up. Uh, and I'm gonna guess that one's gonna be closed as well. I think non-essential businesses are just closed right now. Well, fuck. I guess I gotta order online. Uh, that's a bit of a shame, but it's okay. Uh, it just means I'll have to get lucky with what I buy, because <laughs> I don't really know what I'm doing with bait. But it should be fine. Uh, I gotta do some shopping now for my mom. Go get some food and stuff, so then I'll head home. It started to rain, which is a bit of a shame. I kind of wanted to walk home, but uh, eh, not worth it anyway. You hear that bass line? You hear that fucking feel? That was nuts. This guy's insane. I've made a decision I think I'm going to regret. Sorry for the wind. It's probably really bad for you. Uh, my decision is to walk home instead of taking the bus. Now, as you can see, it's a cloudy day. It looks like it might rain any second. So, this might have been a bad idea. Uh, if it starts raining, I'm fucked. I'm betting they won't. I'm hoping. Uh, why did I decide to walk home? Well, I need the exercise, really. That's the simple answer for you. I need the exercise. Um, while I'm out, I figure I may as well. Go through the park or something. I'll be nice. I also want to smoke a cigarette. I bought a pack. It's been months since I had a cigarette. I can't do this with one hand, so you just gonna have to believe me that <laughs> I bought a pack of cigarettes. Uh, yeah. Maybe I can talk to you more while I'm in the park. Well, this is sort of to excellently remind me of why I'm a hickey meat. Uh, Firstly, it sucks out here. There's people everywhere. There's wind. There's rain. It's cold, but it's also hot. It sucks. But secondly, uh, which I always forget about, my feet are fucked. I have medically official flat feet, right? My, my arches in my feet are too weak. Um, and so my legs and my heels start to hurt a lot when I walk. I literally forgot about it because it's been that long since I've walked a long distance. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I need to take a break because my heels are hurting too much. My flat feet. I really shouldn't be wearing these type of shoes with my flat feet as well. I should, I, I should be wearing like comfortable shoes, not boots. It's really bad, my heels. Uh, yeah, <laughs> that kind of sucks. But uh, it is what it is. It probably got worse because I haven't been exercising or stretching enough. Uh, you know, trapped indoors and shit. So I imagine my heels and my feet and shit are even worse. I, I could probably do some exercises or this physio stuff to make it better. I remember that's what happened a long time ago. When I was a kid, that's how we first found out because I had lots of pain in my legs. And I went to the doctor and they were like, you got flat feet. And uh, he gave me some like physio exercises to do and the pain uh, got better so maybe I need to ask about that or look it up myself I don't need a doctor to tell me what physio exercises I do, I can just google it uh, or dog dog go it actually, I don't use google anymore but uh that's how you know the company's got inside my head, that's how you know I got a fucking mind virus is that the Google it is a verb, and even though I'm not Googling things anymore, I still say Google it. Even though I use DuckDuckGo or Xerox, yes. I'm still saying Google it. Because Google's inside my head. What's that about? There's all sorts of people out here, it's crazy. I forgot how many genres of people there are. They all could come in all type of shapes and sizes, all type of ages, all type of face shapes, or everything. There's so many different types of people. It's well, it's crazy. Some of them are just shouting for no reason. I, just, I saw three people today shouting just in the middle of the street, shouting to themselves for no reason. That's a cute dog. Uh, 
There was one in the bus that was shouting to himself that I recorded, and there was two more in Brixton that were shouting to themselves about nothing, just nonsense. It was great. And then there was a guy shouting about Jesus. There was like a street preacher. He was shouting about Jesus. There was a guy that gave me this leaflet about my soul. I haven't read it yet, but I'm, I'm quite curious about the battle for my soul. They got a nice coat of arms, so you know it's a battle. And uh, I wonder what, what it's trying to sell me. GDPS, I don't know what that is. Gospel Tract and Bible Society. I'm curious. What are they trying to tell me? They're trying to make me... They're trying to make me Christian? Choose Jesus today. Alright, I'll choose Jesus next time I have a choice. This guy's very nice. It's scary. The infinity of it. There's the moon. You see it? The moon's up there. There's been people once that went there a couple times actually to the moon. Um, but then they came back, which is kind of a shame. If I went to the moon, I think I'd want to stay there. After spending all that effort to get there, to go to the moon, they just came back on another rocket ship. I feel like that's a waste of time. Why don't, if you're going to the moon, if I was going to the moon, I'd stay there personally. Um, jumping around and shit. Yeah. Maybe they had limited resources or something. This is a perfect example of a small anarchy. You know how I'm always talking about small anarchies? The production of small anarchies is an ultimate, uh, 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 what's the fucking word? See, being outside fucks in my brain. Negation. This is how you negate capitalism. This. Because there's a road around here, right? There's a, there's a, there's a path. But this is the more efficient path. The anarchy is the more efficient path. And no one's built this just because everyone walks the more efficient path, regardless of what the top-down hierarchies tell them to do, right? Because everyone chooses voluntarily and communally. That's the thing. One person can't make a path like this. Only communal power, collective power, creates a path separate, a, a, a small anarchy, uh, this is not a collective in the sense of a union, right? These are independent people who, for their own self-interest, right? Sterner type shit, you know? This is a union of egoists made this. None of them have even met each other, right? None of them have probably even talked. But, through collective will and self-interest, a muddy path is created that fucks my boots up. That's how we win, guys. <laughs> this is how we win. Even the clouds, right? They're too incomprehensibly far away to really position at any particular distance, right? You kind of feel like they're just everywhere. But really, the clouds are very close compared to the blue. But the blue isn't even real. It looks like a dome, but it's not actually a dome. It just continues infinitely. Um, transitioning to blackness and then stars and galaxies and uh, black holes and old gods waiting to rise again somewhere out there is Yog Sothos right just above me I'm probably looking at him my vision field is probably wide enough to catch him no, now I'll never know. Alright, so the question you're all wondering, right? Why the fuck would a you, of all people, go outside? Well, let me give you a quick recap on the little story. My vape is nearing the end of its life. I need to buy a new one. I don't know anything about vapes, so I thought instead of buying something that might be bad online, let me go to a store and ask someone who knows their shit, and then I can get something that's good. That was the easy option. Now I'm not sure if you caught that in the video, but there are three vape stores 
all three of them were closed, probably because of Corona. I looked it up online beforehand and it said all of them were open. So someone lied to me, and I'll tell you who it was. It was Google, once again, in my brain, fucking with me, right? So that's the first thing that happened, that's the first reason. But the more esoteric reason, it was a flex, right? And what was I flexing? Well, I was flexing my advanced dissociation skills, okay? No one else who is in here, no one else with my brain would have been able to manage that. Only because I was never out, right? That was, you saw outside, that was all astral, right? That was all astral, that was all astral projection, basically. I was so dissociated, personally, permanently, and imperatively, purposefully, that was the word I was looking for, I said three words, none of them were the one I want. Well, the one I want would pers purposefully, with intention, dissociated, this takes an extreme level of skill and mental brainness. I dissociated to hard enough to allow me to do crazy shit, like talk vlog in a crowd of people and shout random bullshit about the moon and the sky in the middle of a park while people are walking past. The reason is because I never left my room, right? I basically just saw the world as a screen and I felt just as comfortable doing that as I would have sitting here doing the same thing, talking nuts to you in my, my happy place, in my real world, in the real world, in here, right? So all I had to do was dissociate hard enough that my brain stayed here. Do you understand? My brain stayed here, only my body was outside. And due to the insanity that is South London, no one really gives a shit what you do. As I said, many people were just shouting to themselves in the street. I just happened to be recording it. No one gives a shit, no one notices. You go on with your day, does life in the big city. It's basically a hell world. It's basically terrible. It's basically the most overstimulating and horrific, traumatizing place one can be, right? There's all type of shit going on. Some of it, you're just quick fire emotions. I'm walking past, quick, someone hands me a Jesus leaflet. Oh, someone's playing a crazy bass line. Oh, someone's shouting about nonsense. Some, some, someone's left, gone and escaped the loony bin, right? That's where I should be. Someone's, there's one of my friends escaped the loony bin, right? You see, this is what I find, this is what I find. If you, if you found a schizo, you found a friend, right? That's what I always say. And by that, I mean I said it right now. That's the point, it was a flex. I was flexing my dissociation. And also on a little bit of a lower level, whenever I see dogs might recording vlogs outside, I get anxious because it's dark and uh, going outside with your phone in the dark around these parts is asking to get your phone no longer be yours, in a sense. Someone's taking that shit, right? And I get weirded out because she's in public, right, talking. And so I was like, what if I just dissociate so hard that I transport myself into public talking into a phone crazily, right? And that's how I did it. That's how I overtook Dotes might. That's how I overtook Digi and all of them. Um, doesn't matter what I said. None of that matters, right? That was all just context. <laughs> I mean, it does matter to some extent. I had to clean my wound, because that shit's doity. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have to go talk to my dad about the lose. It's time once again for the simple and satisfying routine. There we go. This is the least satisfying part, even though that's not bad itself. Begin, simple, satisfying routine.
fuck. I, tr I tried to overcomplicate things in order to speed up the routine. I forgot that the whole point of the routine is that it's simple and satisfying. I fucked the whole thing because I tried to speed up, but it's supposed to be simple and satisfying. There we go, that's simple and satisfying. Part two. That's what the fuck I'm talking about, boy. Simple and satisfying. Unwrap, take the top off, put them both in the bin, take the bottom off, put that in the bin. Fold, 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 tip, squeeze to make sure nothing's left, put it in the bin. Final one, paper in the bin. Let's go. Unwrap, top off, oh that was a clean one. Then one of these. Bam, 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 bam. I didn't do this properly, but it's fine. Squash it. Bam. Done. Full box. You know, that'll cut through any mix, by the way. If you need a shaker. Layer the, I'm telling you, layer the snare. It works well. I guess I'm kind of embarrassed to admit I watch Among Us content. It's fun. It's, it's harmless. I'll just say that. It's not exactly the peak of intellectualism, but sometimes you just need something to sort of fill empty space in your life. I, I did enough today. I... Um, went outside. I uh, I should pause this. Um, I went outside. Uh, I spent money on a vape online, which I ended up buying, and I did research so I knew which one was the right one. I made a song and I mixed another song. I uh, talked to my dad over a Zoom call about uh, philosophy. I read some philosophy today. Uh, I read a bit of Anti Oedipus. Um, although I think I better stop reading it, and I think I might read um, the Critique of Pure Reason instead, because my dad says that's easier. <laughs> he said the uh, Critique of Pure Reason is actually really basic. He just uses big words, so you just need to use like a glossary. Actually, I wanted to read uh, Verba. What was his name? Weber? Is that his name? Gavin Weber? No, that's not him. The fuck? Is his name Weber? Sociologist. Hold on. Where did we go? So, you know, I, 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 could that, that, that go? It's, it's not very good. I will, I will say. Uh, Dr. Cozen says no. Verba? No. Verba? Sociologist? <laughs> I mean, I know he's like a famous sociologist. I'm just going to look up sociology. W. Weber. Max Weber. I mean, I think it's pronounced Weber. There we go, this guy. Wow, that took me fucking ages to find him. Uh, I might read him. Uh, apparently he wrote something about... Uh, well, it must be here somewhere, right? Um, um, well, it'll be one of these. It's something about charismatic leaders that my dad told me to read. Um... And he hates bureaucracy, which I also hate bureaucracy. So, um, well, I don't know if he hates bureaucracy, but he has some critiques of bureaucracy. And I've actually, like, everyone hates bureaucracy, but, like, 
it tends to be like very vague. So I'm hoping this is like some some more concrete, like applicable critique of, of bureaucracy. Uh, so I'm, I think I might check this guy out. Although he's also inspired by Khan. Uh, yeah. So I might I might check that guy out. Anyway, that was complete. But none of this is what I wanted to talk about. I've completely forgotten what I wanted to talk about. I, I didn't even want to talk about Among Us. I had this open just because I was watching it, and I started recording, and I thought, um, let me clarify why I have Among Us up so I don't, you know, I need to, I feel the need to prostate myself. Prostate? No, that's not the right word. Prostrate. Not prostate. <laughs> this is just getting worse and worse. Myself in front of you. Prostatize myself in front of you and justify all my actions to you because I might get judged for watching a disguised toast video by someone who just watched two hours of me fucking talking in a park or whatever. <laughs> anyway, what the fuck was I going to say? Uh, was it about music? No. I don't remember. Fuck. I talked to a normie today over the phone through a very strange, surreal set of circumstances. My mum's friend of a... So, like, a friend of a friend of my mum's is son is about my age and also studying music at university. And so my mum organized with his mum that we would just talk on the phone. Out of, I've never met this guy. I didn't even know his name before today. I have no idea who he is. Uh that we would just talk about music, whatever that means. Um, so that was a thing. Don't know what that was. But uh, so she just sort of pressured me into it. And according to him, his mum also just sort of pressured him into it. And uh, I used a technique when talking to him that I, I find very useful when talking to people, new people, when making new conversations. Uh, here, this is my, this is my PUA... <laughs> um, social engineering game. I actually studied so a little bit of social engineering when I was learning magic, right? So, uh, you know, this is something I picked up then, which is if you meet a new person uh, and you want them to tell you things a bit more openly than they normally would, to, to not be so closed off towards you, which normally I don't want, but in this case, it seems it's a phone call where I thought, fuck it. Um, which is you 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 mention early off uh, something which seems like you might be embarrassed about it, right? So I mentioned, oh yeah, uh, I don't really have many friends in real life. Yeah, I I only have like one friend really. Now, in real life, this is by choice, right? This like this is on purpose. I don't want many friends in real life, and, and I'm not embarrassed about it at all. Like I'm completely ha happy with the like, quality and of my friendships, right? But he doesn't know any of that, so he thinks I just have made something embarrassing and sort of opened up towards him. And this is the weird thing about human psychology, is that he now feels sort of indebted to give me something in return from of him. Like, he now feels like, oh, well, I need to now say something more open and personal in return, because th this guy just sort of opened up to me. If I don't do that, then it will be like I'm sort of giving him the cold shoulder. And so what he opened up about, I found very interesting. Uh, so he goes to uni somewhere outside of London, and all his friends are there. But he had to come back to London because of COVID or something. And all his friends are still where their uni is. So he just has no friends in London. And because of lockdown, he can't travel up to go meet them. Uh, and so he's just fucked, basically. Like, he's super... He, said, he kept saying... He was going crazy, like he felt like he was going crazy. Um, and uh, he really made me realize, like, I've said this before, but I've never had to actually confront it because I don't talk to any of these people. Like, he uh, he, he just seemed like he's not doing well. And I think these normies aren't doing well. Like, I just think these people don't have the capacity to do what we do. They haven't trained. They don't have the mental 
uh, built, built. They're not built for it, right? I'm built for it. You're built for it. They, these people are not built for it. But not just that. So for all of human history, right? Uh, so th this got brought up, right? Let me let me rewind a bit. So during the conversation, <laughs> let me rewind from all of human history to this conversation. Uh, you know, he was kind of shocked to find out I don't have social media, like I don't have Instagram or Snapchat or anything. Uh, he he seemed kind of shocked that I only had like a professional Twitter. Um, and I forget sometimes that that's like a really weird thing to not like that almost everyone my age has five different social medias and I, I'm weird for not having Instagram and not having Snapchat and not having uh, TikTok or whatever people are using these days. I literally don't know. Uh, so, uh, yeah, and then he was talking about how, like, he's just been scrolling social media all day because he has nothing else to do. Uh, so this got me thinking. For all of human history, we're back at all of human history now. There has been one problem, and then very recently, in the grand scheme of things, the problem has completely flipped to the opposite. So for almost all of human history, the problem was that people don't have literacy or access to enough information, right? So like a medieval peasant might be able to improve their life or cure some sort of illness, right? For example, if they just had information that would like show them what sort of medicines to use. Uh, uh, or they might be able to uh, farm more efficiently if they were able to find information about farming techniques. But most of the time, people didn't have access to information or the means to use that information. And then there was a very brief period, a brief transitional gradient period, where literacy rates were high and there were plenty of libraries around and stuff like that. And public education was common. Now, still, there's a limit, a severe limit to the amount of information you can have, but the information is sort of opened up. So most people probably think they have enough, right? Probably most people think they have enough information. And then the Internet comes around, and just like that, the problem flips. The problem is now that everyone has access to all information at all times, and none of, no one has the skills to select which information is important. And for people like this guy here, for normies, for especially normies of my generation or, and maybe, you know, people who grew up with the modern Internet, they've never had to learn the skills to mediate all of this data because an algorithm does it for them. An AI takes that job out of their hands. They have uh, an algorithm which is feeding them content uh, and data that will keep them on, the, on their website. It's like a, a DJ, but for the internet. It's like a, a, a curator. And so they never have to learn the self-curation skills that are, in, that are really, really useful, especially at a time like this when you have nothing to do but be on the internet. Because if you're only on popular meta meat space social media sites like Instagram, um, you're just going to end up like doing bad mental health things like he said he would just look up COVID statistics every day and like read more about COVID on Twitter and just search up stuff about COVID just constantly finding all this information about COVID it's like that's not helping anyone <laughs> that's not helping you and you're not helping anyone else with that information you're only going to end up in you know getting depressed and paranoid about that but if you've always had an algorithm to mediate content for you you never learn to con you never learn the self-control to to avoid that and you never learn the replacements that's important because it's not really about self-control it's about value right it's like why would i even bother doing that when i have much higher value content that i could be you know right now i'm what we're listening to an, fuck, listening to an audio book of david graeber debt the first two thousand years like that's much more useful knowledge than you know oh a new strain of COVID was discovered i don't know uh or oh this celebrity did something <laughs> which is the sort of thing you get on mainstream social media uh yeah now i'm not saying i'm superior to this guy at all like that might be how it sounds because i'm saying normies as, as if it's a pejorative but i'm not actually saying that I, I i just feel bad for him because i happen to have trained in this art from a young age and he hasn't and almost no one has 
and I happen to have a really great uh, network of friends over the internet, which, you know, none of them have been, like, this hasn't affected our friendships at all, really. Uh, you know, I would like to come visit them or them to come visit me or whatever, but, uh, you know, that well, that hadn't happened before, and it just means it's postponed for a bit longer. It's, we still have our right friendships, but for these, like, a lot of these people don't have online friends, and if they do, their online friends are based around, like, games, like, you know, oh, I have this guy that I met in Fortnite and we play Fortnite together or something. And uh, no one plays Fortnite anymore, but you know what I mean. That was just an example. Uh, uh, which is, you know, that's a very limited way to hang out with someone. Uh, it's it's it, it's not impossible that you could form a deep friendship like that. In fact, it's very much it's possible. With, I, I've seen it happen with people. But, uh, you know, it's... It, if you're limited to only playing Fortnite with someone, then you're only going to play Fortnite with that person. Uh, I, I've had CSGO friends that I only played CSGO with, and, you know, it's not a very deep friendship. It's not a replacement for, you know, a true friendship. Um, and uh, so this guy has just nothing, like, nothing to do. He doesn't have the tools with which to, you know, figure out, today I'm going to learn about... Uh, Deleuze, and then I'm going to watch this really interesting YouTube video from my subscription feed about black Japanese woodblock carving, and then I'll spend two hours making a song, and then I will voice chat with my friends, uh, and then uh, I will watch some bullshit YouTube to sort of calm down my brain, and then I will uh, go on 4chan and read some crazy conspiracy theories on X, or, uh, you know, something like that, uh, and then I'll play CSGO for a couple hours, and then I'll go to bed. Like, that's, uh, like, you know, it's not the most crazy, like, intellectual fucking thing ever, but, like, half of that shit these people don't have access to. Like, you don't have the friendship network, you don't have crazy 4chan shit. You know, I don't even use 4chan that much, uh, like, not super often, but the great thing about 4chan is that there's no algorithm that's deciding what content that you're seeing. And so you're, there is no filter bubble. Like everyone talks about the filter bubble, right? How you only see things that you already agree with. 4chan is the exact opposite. It seems like you only see things you disagree with. <laughs> on, on image boards, you only see things you disagree with. Uh, I would be very willing to bet that this guy has not used a website owned by a person, not a corporation, in years, right? And I, I think that's actually a terrifying prospect that 99% of people, like, close to me and, like, who are in my demographic haven't used a website that didn't have a mobile app in years. That's, like, really scary to me because, you know, these corporations have ulterior motives, uh, and sometimes people can have ulterior motives too, but if you're not doing it for raw shareholder money, then your motives aren't as ulterior <laughs> as they could be. Uh, yeah. Just wanted to say, like, I've been forced to come face-to-face -face with the reality that most people are facing right now, and no wonder everyone's complaining about lockdown. At first... I was like, haha, now you all have to deal with the same shit I have to deal with. But now I've realized, like, they don't have, they deal with different shit. Like, the shit I deal with is much better managed. <laughs> Even though ostensibly my life is more isolated and worse, uh, like, I have, I have the tools in my brain to manage the data. I have the autism to database my life in a situation like this and form um and i have the the, the I, I don't know what to call it to manage my identities under pressure uh the most people don't have that and i i um i'm not sure i'm not sure it can end well like i feel like the world's going to be especially fucked because of that like i i wouldn't be surprised if people come out of this and they are like somehow more ruthless than before. Does that make sense? I wouldn't be surprised if people if 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 the world comes out of this more ruthless. Maybe it won't. Maybe the opposite will happen. Maybe people will um 
Yeah. See, my, my theory is that once COVID's over, there'll be a brief period of a few months when everyone bounces back and sort of rebounds in the opposite direction. So everyone's constantly hanging out with their friends, constantly going to restaurants and shows and gigs and all the all of that stuff. And everyone's going to try and go on holiday immediately, right? Uh, like it's going to bounce back in a crazy way. And then things will just sort of go back to normal, but everyone's way more ruthless because now they understand isolation. And once you understand isolation, you, you, you know, your brain changes. Um, it's, it's been pointed out to me once or twice that my house has a lot of modern art in it, right? Uh, like the famous No Thank You painting, right? The famous one. Uh, uh and like, I must be rich because of that. Almost all of it was done by like a family friend, basically. Uh, yeah, it's a bit of a complicated story behind behind it. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, like it's not like super fancy. But I mean, they they bought it from from him but like yeah he's like a family friend who, who's like an artist uh, I feel like talking about this is uh, reifying it but uh, as I kind of expected to happen was um, I've been well recently I've been getting weird heart palpitations I say weird because they're like they feel different. They almost feel... My old palpitations sort of felt like my heart missed a, a beat and then did an extra hard beat the next one to sort of make up for it, right? So it's like it missed one, and so then the next one was like twice as hard, and then it would go back to normal. But these ones feel more like weird fluttering, and it's very uncomfortable. I mean, both types are very uncomfortable. This one is also very uncomfortable, but more so it's new, and th that's scary. Why is my heart doing new things? Like, and also it's painful, which is like the old ones didn't leave any pain, whereas this one is slightly painful. And the problem is, this is the problem with the mental health industry, I just want to make something incredibly clear. If you don't support free take A, if you don't want a free take A, get the fuck off this channel, right? If you think he deserves to be in prison for killing someone or beating up an old man or any of those things, fuck off. Go away. Let me tell you very simply and clearly. TK is one of the greatest artists of our generation. It is more important for the grand success of humanity that he is able to make more music than it is that he gets punished for petty crimes, petty morality. TK's contribution to art is much greater than whatever would be lost by allowing him to, you know, be free with only a medium punishment for whatever moral atrocities that people assume and say he committed, right? Even though he was set up, it was all a fucking scam. He doesn't deserve to be in prison. His, but even if we assume, even if he's the worst guy ever, right? It is a, more of a benefit to humanity to have him out in the world free to make art than it is Let's talk free open source software and adjacent movements real quick. So I don't need to explain all the basics. Like, hey guys, so, because you know, I use Linux. Um, but 
I basically want to justify myself a little bit and then critique myself a little bit. So I recently might been making a move to get my friends off of Discord onto Matrix, right, which is distributed, not a central. Firstly, Discord is unencrypted, which I think is just unacceptable in 2021 to have non-end-to-end encrypted messaging. And I've always thought that was bad, but never had the balls or the motivation to just make the jump to um, Matrix or something else. Matrix is end-to-end encrypted. It's also um, distributed or federated. So if I wanted to, I could be running my own Matrix uh, server. I'm not. I'm using Matrix.org, uh, but I could, and I might in the future. I, I'm considering it. Uh, but as of now, I'm using Matrix.org, and I don't really see any problem with that. Uh, but I might in the future use my own uh server. That's all well and good, but that's only one of the functionalities of Discord, which is text chat. Whoops. Text chat. And for that purpose, it serves it excellently. I haven't had any problems with the text chat in Matrix so far. I don't think any of my friends have either. Well, very minor problems with clients being poorly designed and hard to navigate, but uh, that's not really a problem with the protocol itself just a problem with the clients and uh you know once you figure out where stuff is in a menu once you know where it is forever so it's not really that much of a problem but the other problem is voice calls right that's the other main functionality of discord voice calls and uh now element which is one matrix client uh, does have some basic voice functionality but it's terrible it's really laggy because uh, it's a peer-to-peer there's also Jammy or Yammy, which I think uses the same protocol, if I remember correctly. Um, and it's also really laggy because it's peer-to-peer and basically unusable. Uh, and so uh, I ended up setting up a TeamSpeak uh, on this Windows machine. Finally found a use for you. So this is this is now a server that just runs my TeamSpeak server. Right, uh, and that works great. I expected that to be laggy and bad, but no, it just works. It's 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 great. However, I uh, I can't. I literally forgot that Teamspeak isn't open source. Teamspeak is actually proprietary software. Uh, Mumble is the open source one. Teamspeak is proprietary, and I'd forgotten about this. And after a lot of haggling and convincing my friends to come to TeamSpeak, I feel like now, in order to be consistent, I'm going to have to, first off, I'm going to have to set up a Mumble server on that computer, which is already a bit of a pain. Uh, Not that much of a pain, but, you know, it's a thing. And then I'm going to have to get it to work and everything. (laughs) And then I have to convince my friends to move over to Mumble. Um which I might do in the future, or I might not. And the reason being, um, I like free software and, and so on. However, the main reason that I like free software is for, uh, well, there's various reasons, but um, none of them count really. Like if you're talking about privacy, well, I'm running it on my own server. So that's about as private. Like I, all the data is going through here. No one else is seeing it. Like I, about as private as you can get. Uh, uh, in terms of sort of ethical side of things, huh. it's not ideal, but it's not awful, right? Like it's they. It's not like um, Discord that sells your data or anything. It's not like you know. It's not that bad. It's not as good as an, an ideally fast alternative uh but it's i'm honestly i don't feel bad about it at all uh i mean i might switch to mumble i don't know but like the reasons for open source software is security and privacy uh and you know practicality so like if a if a software is open source then 
it means anyone uh, can sort of adapt it to do whatever they want it to do, and therefore, you know, uh, you, you you find a lot of useful stuff gets done because it not it's not just a few people working on it who are allowed to work on it. Anyone who wants to can work on it, and that means you know bugs get patched quicker, exploits get patched quicker. Um, stuff like that. It's more secure because we can people can see what the back end is doing, um, and I guess that's a possibility with with um, Teamspeak. Maybe uh, maybe there's some backdoor that sends all my information to Teamspeak HQ. I doubt it. Um, I feel like that's a little bit too conspiratorial. Like I understand how their business model works without that Discord. I don't like that. This model doesn't work without them selling your data. I, I can't imagine how that would work, even though they claim they don't. They do. Like it's obvious. But TeamSpeak, they do like, uh, like, uh, um, they like sell servers basically. I think. So that, like, I don't know exactly what the business model is. Maybe I'm wrong. Hey, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm completely wrong. Um, but either way, this is the, this is not what I originally intended to talk about. What I originally intended to talk about here was Peertube. So, um, uh, Horror Love has been uploading to Peertube recently. Um, now, I have to say, I do not intend to use Peertube anytime soon. Uh, why? It just doesn't really fit my my... Well, I've already talked about it in these videos, right? My goals of of, of intruding on Google's space. Uh, TeamSpeak is just not doing that at all. Which is uh, not TeamSpeak, PeerTube, sorry, is not doing that at all. And that's also cool, but uh, you know it's different. And what I said in the uh, previous clip when I was talking about that, where I said if I have 400 subscribers and and even only 10% of them give a shit, that's 40 people. Well, on PeerTube, no one has, like, 400 subscribers, you'd be the most popular PeerTuber in existence. No one has 400 subscribers. And um, I I quite like having an audience. Uh, It's, you know, maybe call me narcissistic or whatever, but... uh, it's nice to have people who watch the videos and comment and interact and even if they don't just knowing that someone sees it who isn't just like a couple of your mates but someone you may have never talked to before might see it like that's a cool feeling um it's kind of it's part of the point and peertube just doesn't have that no one's watching things on peertube like there's about five people who watch things on Peertube. All the views on Peertube come from the same five people. I'm convinced of it, and they're all the Peertube devs. Uh, is this a cope? Mm, I don't know. I can't decide if it's a cope or not. It's a bit of a cope on the one hand. Yes, it's a bit of a cope. Like in some ways, it's a cope. In other ways, it's not a cope. Like I have legitimate reasons. Um. I, I need to look more, like, there's other options for, like, I mean, I guess I could just clone my videos and just upload them both here and on Peertube. Like, that's a, a thing, but that's a bit of a hassle, and I don't like putting effort into things. Um, I Like, there's definitely an argument to be made that, oh, maybe YouTube will just shut down their servers one day and then everything will be lost. Well, I don't really care about that. None of this is of value. Like, and even if it was... Everything will be lost anyway. You know, I met a traveler from an antique land. <laughs> I, I'll, I'll say no more than that. If you don't know what that means, Google that sentence. Uh, yeah. Everything is transient. This too shall pass, right? This too shall pass. Death comes to all. Um, yeah. So it does, that's that, that's not really an issue for me at all. That's not something that crosses my mind. Preservation, yeah, if anything, I don't. I want the opposite. I want trans, transience. I desire transience. I desire an embodiment of transience because obviously everything is transient. But lots of things are very. They don't like to admit it. Most most of the time, things don't like to admit their own transience. But, uh, 
proprietary software freely admits its own transients. Another small thing, which is only tangentially related, very vaguely tangent, a small thread of an idea, a spider's web connecting the two, is that my ThinkPad, this little lad over here, has been uh, running quite hot lately. Like average CPU temps maybe range from 70-ish to like maybe 85 uh, degrees Celsius maybe even higher, and that's not doing anything particularly uh, heavy. So that's like just watching YouTube, browsing the internet. Maybe I have YouTube video playing in MPV and uh, a chat client open to talk to my friends, uh, and I'm ending up at like 80-something CPU temp. That's a bit ridiculous, a bit ridiculous. Um, sometimes it gets hotter even. Uh, which I think can't be good for the longevity of my laptop. Now, I know these ThinkPads do just run hot as a general rule of thumb, but uh, I feel like that's a bit too hot. And uh, there are, it seems like the more I look at it, the more the solutions on the internet say you have to replace the thermal paste. But to replace the thermal paste, you have to literally disassemble the whole thing. You cannot get access to that without literally every single part has to be disassembled. It's a whole process. And I'm a fucking retard when it comes to hardware. Like I, I'm a retard when it comes to software, but at least with software there's an undo button. So it's okay when I'm a retard about it. If I fuck something up when I'm disassembling or reassembling my laptop, then it, it's fucked. And I don't want it to be fucked. There is a sort of medium solution, which is that I could just take the keyboard off, buy a can of compressed air, and compress the air, the fan, but not replace the, the thermal paste. Um, and that might help a bit. I, I'm surprised I haven't done that yet, in fact. I should probably do that. That that should help with the cooling. But uh, I'm I, now that I know in the back of my mind, like, I probably should replace the thermal paste, but I do not trust myself to do it properly. Maybe, I don't I don't know what the answer here is. Do I just do it? Do I practice? Do I do a practice run on my other ThinkPad? Uh, it's hard to say. It's definitely hard to say with these sorts of things. Uh, I'm, yeah, I'm just worried that I'll put it back together wrong or damage a part or something like that, and then no more computer for you. Not good. Uh, not good at all. I cannot afford a new one, cannot afford to replace parts, none of that. Uh, so I don't think I'll be doing that anytime soon. Um but I will be knowing in the back of my mind that I ought to be doing it, and that is arguably worse than fucking up. <laughs> when you're in the brain pen. This is the brain pen, by the way. This is my brain pen of my own creation. Can you imagine what Foucault would think of Hikikomori? He would have a field day with us. Can you imagine? I'm trying to imagine Foucault talking about hikis. He would be, he would he would be so happy to find out that we exist. <laughs> no philosopher. It's actually really late. I don't know why I have my light on. I I'm like seriously injured in like ten different parts of my body right now. My thumbs fucked up. You saw that when I went outside. Then when I went outside, my sock tore a hole in itself while I was walking around and that meant that my foot was rubbing up against the side of my boot and I got a blister it's it's pretty big but it's not like deep basically like it's wide but not deep so it's it's just like mildly painful blister on my heel then I had a weird thing in my mouth which I thought was like I was getting worried it was like at first I thought it might be like some sort of scar that I'd like bitten my it's kind of like on the inside of my bottom lip. 
I thought maybe it was a scarf and when I'd bitten it while I was asleep. And then I thought maybe it was a uh, cancer or a tumor or, or, or something like that. Um, and then I realized, uh, then I thought like maybe, I don't know what I, I thought it was, but then just maybe a few hours ago, I, I was like, right, I'm going to go have a look at this. So I went and sort of got my phone out to use as a mirror and I like looked at it and I couldn't really tell what it was. But as I was looking at it, I sort of poked it and it popped. So I guess it was just like some sort of ulcer or something like that. And it would like deflated basically. Um, sorry, this is probably not very fun for you to hear about, but that like hurts now. <laughs> um, my leg hurts from walking around. Oh, and my heart has been fucking up again recently. I've been getting a new type of... Did I mention this already in the video? I don't remember. I, I mean, my, my palpitations have changed. That's the other thing I was... Like, that's the, kind of the, probably the biggest deal. That my heart has been misbehaving itself in a new way. Although I believe that's linked to my gut biota. I, I believe if I take better care of my gut biota, then my heart will fix itself. Um, why do I think that? Um, I don't know why I think that. And the fact that I don't know why I think that makes me think that it's my gut biota who has sent that to my brain as as an unconscious signal, which means that it must be true. Because they, they know what's good for me more than I know what's good for me. Um, and so I'll listen to my gut biota and try and eat more beans or whatever the fuck they want. Eat more beans and eat more leafy greens. That's what I've been trying to do. Um, making them happy, although I actually haven't done a very good job of that today. Uh, but tomorrow <laughs> I will eat some beans and some leafy greens. I, I've also, I just, I eat less just in general. I've been eating a bunch of shit lately. I need to eat less shit. No wonder it's having consequences. My gut biota is finally saying enough is enough. Look what you've done to yourself. Look what you've done to us. We run this place. Now fix up your fucking diet or we will revolt. And this is them sort of, this is them burning down a police station or something. Revolting. And honestly, I fucking respect it. Sometimes when I get sick or when I get a disease or something, I, I end up just, I, I, I want to side with the disease, you know. <laughs> I want to side with that guy. He feel, I feel like he's the underdog. I don't know why it's a he. I feel like diseases, viruses, are masculine. Um, I guess viruses that are like colonizers and colonizers are masculine. So maybe that's why. Uh, cancer is female in my eyes. But viruses and diseases and such like that are male. I don't know, I never thought about that before, but I just realized that's how I've always conceptualized it. Also, earlier today, maybe this this conversation has gone in five different directions. Oh, well, it's a no thank you vlog. You should be used to it. Um, earlier today, maybe like seven hours ago, six hours ago, I was like really looking forward to, okay, I just got to wait a little bit longer and I can get, fucking drunk and that's going to be great fun but I didn't I just never didn't end up feeling like drinking at all which is always a strange feeling because you're not sure which version of you to believe do you believe the version of you right now or do you believe the past version of you <laughs> you know like there was a past version of me that knew that getting drunk was a really good idea and there's a current version of me that doesn't think getting drunk is a good idea so who do I believe here like, who is it, who has more merit? There is no way to tell. Um, and I often get tripped up by that. David Graeber is great because, firstly, he knows his shit. Secondly, he doesn't talk like a retarded philosopher. He just gives you information in a clear way. And thirdly, you can't listen to him talk and be depressed or read him and... and lose all faith in humanity like I was after reading, after, you know, going straight from um, Adam Curtis to Mark Fisher to Nick Land, you know, and now straight into 
David Graeber, it's like, oh, pessimism, further, pe- like, that uh, we, we are about to enter a new era of societies of control to it's easier to imagine the end of the world than the end of capitalism to capitalism is an, in- is an inevitable techno future AI which just manifests itself and humans will die out in the near future to actually um, like anarchism is like the default state of humanity and like not that unlikely as you might think <laughs> like it's actually pretty easy you, it, you just have to get a bunch of people to, together to do it and then it just happens it's not that difficult like some of the stuff David Graeber says, and like it's because he knows his shit that it's useful. Like I've never thought about taxes. I don't think I've ever understood taxes until this moment. Like I always assumed, as I think most people do, again I'm just parroting David Graeber here, that oh, why do you pay taxes? Well, you basically pay taxes so that the government, well hypothetically, the government can spend it on. So like, you know, social programs or the military or whatever they want to spend it on, right? So you, you, everyone pays taxes, and that's basically giving your money to the government so they can, uh, you know, use that money to imp- hypothetically improve society. Well, practically, um, you know, spend on the military or whatever. Both of those are, like, no, no matter if you take the idealist or realistic view on that, it's not true. If the government just wanted money, they could just print more money. They could just take control of the gold mines. They could just, you know, take control of some industry, the oil industry. Like, if, if the government could get money from anywhere, they're the government. Uh, taxes doesn't make any sense. Why would you try and get money from random, you know, people who don't have that much money instead of just pr- printing it for yourself? It doesn't make any sense. The re- like taxes exist to distribute wealth. Like th- the reason you pay taxes is it's a way for uh, to to like sort of organize where the wealth is distributed among society. But somehow we don't think about it that way at all. We think about it as if taxes are you know paying your debt to the government for allowing you to live in their territory like you're paying rent on uh, a house you didn't buy you were just born in and uh, they use that rent to upkeep the house or uh, whatever and you don't really get too much of a say you get a bit of a say but barely uh, in how they spend the money upkeeping the house that you didn't even want to particularly be in in the first place Uh, but hey that's just how the world works well actually it's not just how the world works it's not how the world works at all that's a scam. Like that's not how that's not how it works. It's not what it's meant to be. Like the whole idea that the the poor are paying more money than the the rich right now in terms of taxes. Like the whole idea that um you know billionaires and giant corporations like Amazon can pay almost no tax. Um, actually, not only does it is it like abhorrent in the obvious way. But it also completely defeats the point of taxation in the first place, unless you actually see that that's the point of taxation now. Is that the if the point of taxation is to distribute the is to organize a, a way to distribute wealth through society, and you see that the rich are being taxed less than the poor in this strange mixed up way. You know, I'm talking relatively here as in like percentage wise um well then clearly the point of it is to distribute the wealth from the from the poor to the rich like that's the organization that's being done someone's organizing it and those people have organized it in that way some people in charge of the distribution of wealth have decided to distribute it in that way um that's just like you, I never thought about it that way. And it's like, oh, so there's another uh, sort of root by root of control. But it's not for some reason. I don't feel depressed about it. I feel like I've learned something. Yeah, I feel like, oh, that's how it's been working this whole time. 
and like David Graeber, he's like, he told the story, not in this book, but in an interview where he was talking about I think Argentina, and how they they had like just this, in in the in like the in like two thousand one I think, they were just like, they had a big social movement where they just basically said fuck all the politicians like literally that was their like. Their goal was, I think their their slogan was, they can all go to hell. Like, that was the, the slogan of the movement was, they can all go to hell. It got to the point where politicians couldn't even go to restaurants uh, because they would just have food thrown at them by regular people who were eating there because they just hated, the, everyone just hated the politicians and they just said, we, we, they, these guys aren't fucking doing anything to help us. Like, we, we can just live without them. Like, they can all go to hell. We what does do what does get on with it without them? We don't you know fuck them, um, and because of that complete delegitimization, the politicians in Argentina when they tried to like, they were like okay we need to they they some like democratic socialists got elected like very basic, milk toast democratic socialists got elected and to try and re-legitimize themselves he like rejected some sort of like some deal from the IMF. Right, and because of that, that's what snowballed into the sort of whole collapse of the IMF and then cancellation of third world debts, all because of a social movement in Argentina. Like people in the third world in poverty had their debt cancelled, like loads of people and countries in the uh, in the third world. Like what? You never think about stuff like that. You never think about like a social movement in just a country that's just basically a general fuck you to politicians having any sort of real world effect you know we we've, we've sort of been programmed to think that these things are just temper tantrums um and i think in a lot of ways they are in a lot of places particularly in america uh americans never really figured out how to do it well okay that's not true Black Americans figured out how to do it. <laughs> White Americans never figured out how to do it. Um, uh, the, the, so I, I don't really know where I'm going with this, but I'm feeling a little more optimistic than I was a few days ago, which is nice. Um, and I also feel like I'm learning a lot about economics. Uh, I would definitely recommend that the first, first 5,000 years. It's a good book. I completely forgot to make my point in that last clip like the reason i mentioned that was because i was trying to imagine um what a possible you know anarchist society might look like um and what my position in that place would be and i think a lot about like well it, it's it, is it idealist to just assume that people would do the difficult jobs with anarchism like think about Valve when they had their sort of more flat organisational system and no one wanted to do the boring part where of like polishing a game for release well like like would I like I, I think like well I wouldn't do any of the boring jobs like I I, I mean it's easy to forget I do actually do productive labour I do do a job, uh, I, I make music or whatever, but, you know, societies can run without music, they can't run without food. Um, so, like, what would my position be? Would I be, like, hated <laughs> in an anarchist world? Or, uh, like, what, what What would I do? And I, I thought about it, I thought, like, I, I wouldn't be opposed. I actually would not be opposed to doing useful stuff in my like extra time because that's one of the great things about anarchy anarchism or anarchy or whatever and one of the things that actually stops me and makes me so anti-work on capitalism is the sort of bureaucracy and reification I guess of a job so like when you have a job that's your job and now it is your job um, like uh, you okay? I am a bartender. That's what I do every day. I tend bars. I am a uh, supermarket clerk. I stock shelves for you know 
10 hours a day and then I go home or like, oh, I, you know, etc. Well, that's, uh, it's no wonder I don't want to do any of that. But in under an, an anarchist system or within an anarchist system, I guess it's not really under, is it? Um, within an anarchist system, there's, even Marx talked about this, there's no reason for that level of intense specialization. I mean, there can still be specialization that has to be really to have any form of, you know, complex society. Not that I necessarily even want a complex society, but whatever. Um, like, uh, but the idea that you do one thing all day and that's your life, and it's sort of official. It's almost, it's like a bureaucratic thing, right? Like you get a job and you have to do all this bureaucracy of like, this is my job now, you know? If I could just do odds and ends wherever it was needed, I think I would actually be basically okay with that. If like I was just hanging out, you know, in my little weird anarchist town or wherever, I'm making music all day, and then my friend Bob comes up to me and says, hey, hey, no, thank you we could do with an extra pair of hands down at the uh, farm if you want to come help out. I'm not going to say no. Like, sure, why not? You know, help him out, have a drink afterwards. I don't know what, I don't want, it seems fine to me. Like, sure, that like the work might be hard or whatever, but sometimes that's fine. And maybe there would be times when you would need some way to enforce uh, sort of the worst jobs on people. Uh, but a lot of those worst jobs would just disappear, like bureaucratic jobs, which are so fucking, no one really likes them. Um, you know, you could just abolish them. <laughs> They're not really necessary for a, a world to function, to keep people alive and so on. Uh, so a lot of the worst jobs would disappear. And, of course, right now, automation is like a horrible curse because people lose their jobs. But when people don't need to work to eat, like when, when, when that's not such a big deal, like we don't have this puritanical, you have to earn everything you have, right? Like if, if it's just like, well, of course you have a right to basic living conditions, like of course you get to eat and have a house and stuff. Well, then automation becomes the exact, it becomes a blessing. It's great. No one has to work as much. So the more technology advances and the further automation comes, the less work I have to do, the less work any of any, anyone else has to do, more free time. And with, a, with the whole system that's designed more amorphously where people aren't just stuck in one job uh, for hours and hours at a time, when people, like that allows the labor to be more distributed. So even the jobs that are kind of, uh, you know, taxing or boring or whatever, like, maybe there's some system where everyone just does one hour of that a week and you know i can't say i would love it can't say it would be great but honestly like i i feel like i would i would i would just about chip in you know just for the sake of maybe i wouldn't maybe i wouldn't maybe i'm being too too utopian here maybe i would still be a lazy fuck um but I think there's a there's a non-zero chance that I would be okay with that sort of set with that sort of setup, you know. Um, of course, that is assuming that people are always nice to each other, um, and that I don't hate people. But I do kind of hate people, and people don't tend to be nice to me. But either way, like I'm still doing productive labor when I'm making music. So, I mean, it may not be essential labor for the survival of the human race, but. Uh, it's better than being a bureaucrat. This guy called Sadhguru, right? You might find him on YouTube. He's sort of a popular, uh, like mystic yogi, Indian type of guy. You know, like he's got he's got the big beard. He's got the whole look like down. Really, he's got the look. He's got the mannerisms just down. Like he's a very typical yogi type of mystic guy that you would expect right except he's also like kind of cool like he he's like up to date on technology and he like uh, makes lots of jokes like he has a lot of sense of humor and he's a very charismatic speaker and he's very popular 
right? And he's not sort of up his own ass, although he is actually. But he doesn't. He doesn't like talk about himself that way. He he's a a, a, a yogi for the modern age, I'll say. And listen, he's not. He, he's a fucking genius. I'll tell you that much. He's a genius, but not for anything he says, but for how he talks. He's a genius public speaker. He's he's his ideas are nonsense. <laughs> like his his actual like what he actually is saying when you get down to it, uh, it's complete. Not even important because that's not what he's there for. He's just a charismatic guy, and that's why he's popular. Um, you know, he's he's not particularly intelligent. I mean. The, what I mean by that is, like, he's not, like, some all-knowing sage. He's just a guy who knows how to say words very well. Um, he, he's, yeah. So I, I ended up just randomly clicking. I, I've seen him around, and I always find him funny to watch because I like to look at the ways he plays with language to make himself seem smarter than he is. Um, and then, uh, you know, I, I find that stuff fascinating, the sort of techniques used by public speakers to manipulate their audiences. And I don't think he's doing it maliciously. It's just his job, you know, in the same way that I like watching him because he's, he's a funny, even though I don't take any of his ideas seriously, I don't think anyone should. Um, he's like, a, he's just a funny guy to, like, he's a charismatic. It's kind of like watching a Let's Player. Like, sure, I, I don't know if I agree with everything that my, my favorite Let's Player says in the world, right? But, you know, I watch them because they're kind of a funny, entertaining guy, and that's it. It's a similar sort of thing. Now, I, I don't watch Sadhguru very much because um, he's not that funny and entertaining. I've only seen little bits of his videos before I got on board. But I do like to pay attention to the way he manipulates language. And so I just now clicked on one of his videos where he's having some sort of conversation with a rabbi, right? And for some reason, the video starts midway through a sentence, which is very strange, um, where he's saying something along the lines of, now, this is sort of my interpretation of what he's saying because he speaks in vague spiritual terms. But I think what he's tr what he's trying to say is like, um, if you come with problems of uh, love or emotions and etc., then these are internal phenomena. They're not real existential phenomena. Um, and he's sort of implying that oh, through spiritual study and you know meditation or whatever, you can sort of fix sort sort yourself out internally with that sort of stuff. Like you don't make it on anyone else's business. That's like a private spiritual matter. I think like that's a matter for spirituality. That's not a matter for the government or anything like that. I think is what he's trying to imply. Um, and so the rabbi says. Well, I don't know if you would say love, if I would say love is not a real phenomenon, I mean, it, it was a totally internal phenomenon. I think love plays a big part in a lot of people's, a very real uh, part of many people's lives, which I think is a pretty reasonable point, you know? And then Sadhguru is like, okay, I'll get to, uh, let me get at that, right? That's what he says, let, let, me get, let me get to that. And then he just starts talking about something else. And it's fucking genius because he says, let me get to that. And then when he starts talking about something else, you assume that he's sort of building up the basis of an argument to apply to the point, right? So he says, let me talk about something else. And then he starts basically playing random games with language, like audience participation games with language, where he says stuff like, when you have um, a little bit of pleasure in your mind, you call that happiness. And when you have lots of pleasure, you call that joy. When you have a little pleasure in your surroundings, you call that success. And when you have a lot of pleasure, you call it wealth. When you have a little pleasure in love, you call it com uh, compassion. And when you have a lot of pleasure, you call it love or whatever. Like he just keeps going on about that and then never comes back to the original point at all. And it's fucking genius because he talked for so long about something completely separate, right? That you accepted him going into it. You didn't, when he went into that tangent, right? You, you didn't think, what the fuck? He just completely went on to something else because he prefaced it with, let me get to that, which implies that he's setting something up so that he can respond. But then he takes so long to set this stuff up that you forget about the question and you just pay attention to whatever the fuck he's saying. Genius move. Like, that's the sort of shit, like, they should be teaching, like, these are the games that public speakers and charismatic people play with your mind that you just have to be aware of. Because, like, 
what the fuck does that mean? He didn't, he just didn't have any response. And so instead of responding, he just started talking about something completely different. But he did it in such a clever way that no one even noticed that's what he did, except for me, because I'm, I'm sitting here as a passive observer paying attention to the way he's talking instead of paying attention to the things he's saying. Um, which, which is always a fun thing to do, by the way. If you ever get bored in a conversation um, or bored watching some teacher or anything like that, if you ever get bored while someone else is talking, instead of paying attention to what they're saying, pay attention to how they're saying it and then like figure out stuff about the, how their mind's working through that. That's something you, fun you can do. But yeah, this sad guru guy, what a genius at public speaking and what a complete idiot when it comes to what he's actually talking about. You get one per day. You get one, it's like a PG-13 movie. You get one say, 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 fuck. In real life, you get one schizo post per day. My daily ration of schizo posting. Let me explain ghosts to you. Let me explain my theory about ghosts. So how do you explain the fact that ghosts are like very widespread across ghosts, by the way, here I'm using as a general term, spirits, paranormal phenomena, demons, all cryptids, all of these are included in my ghost word, right? Ghosts are very widespread phenomena across the world. Different disconnected cultures have some form of ghosts, right? Many, many people claim to have seen them. Many people claim to have seen similar ones and corroborate stories about certain cryptids and whatever. And yet, the proof that we get about these things is shit. It's shitty, damaged, uh, you know, uh, bad, blurry video, shitty pictures, inconclusive, never prop you, There is no evidence that cannot be doubted to prove the existence of any of these things, right? All the evidence is just so tenuous. Why is this? Well, here's my solution. We often think of ghosts as being echoes of the past, but what if they're echoes of the future, right? What if we live in a block universe? That means there is only one timeline. There isn't multiple timelines, not many worlds, none of that stuff. We live in a block universe with one predetermined future, right? Because time is just a, you know, a, a dimension like space. It already, in some sense, the future already exists. We're just waiting to get there, in some sense. Uh... And uh, so what if we live in that type of universe and ghosts are caused by some phenomenon or series of phenomena in the future, which are, and this is the key point, preventable, a series or singular preventable phenomenon in the future, right? And then somehow that sends them back to the past to fuck with us, right? What if that's the case? That explains why we never have any information about them because if we did have information about ghosts, we could figure out how to prevent ghosts from ever happening. And then we wouldn't, whatever event creates them would be prevented. Therefore they would never come back to the past. And therefore we would never find that information in order to prevent them. But then if we never prevent them, they exist. And so they come back. To, so it's a paradox, time paradox, right? And the universe doesn't like time paradoxes. So it just naturally organizes itself to avoid them. And so therefore the universe just always will naturally organize itself to the point where there, it is impossible to get any good look at any of these phenomena, because uh, if you did get a good look at them, or if we really like knew they existed and studied them carefully, we would prevent them, in which case it would cause a time paradox. So that's why um, all these ghosts and cryptids and etc. are, um, you know, there's no proof for them. There's, there's, or the proof is really inconclusive because uh, they, there's, there's time shenanigans going on here, right? There's time shenanigans. Once famously quoted as saying, 4chan is like if Reddit was a website. Uh, but let's actually take a look at the difference between 4chan and Reddit, not just an, an, in a very obvious way, right? Because it... To us, like, 4chan is too normy for us, right? But let's actually take a look at this. 4chan has about 20 million users per month, right? Reddit has about 52 million users per day. 430 million per month. 
I had completely no idea how much how much bigger Reddit was than 4chan. That's in, that's just ridiculous. Like Reddit, I thought like, oh well, most people don't even know what Reddit is. Like only that's only normally for people who are deep into the internet. But 430 million users makes it one of the most used websites on the whole internet, right? As far as I know, that's ridiculous. And of course, 4chan is up there in the top probably one percent of websites, top top zero point one percent of websites or whatever. But compared to the like twenty million compared to four hundred and thirty million is a big fucking difference. That's a big, big fucking difference. <laughs> That's a very big difference. And 4chan is still normie shit. So you have to get really small to avoid normie shit. Even Lane Chan is normie shit these days. But I don't know if it's normie shit. There's still some good fucking shit on there. Like Okay, recently I went on Lane Chan again for the first time in a long time because I thought maybe it, maybe I would, maybe it was just me that grew out of Lane Chan, but not Lane Chan. The posts got worse. But no, I was right. The posts on Lane Chan just got worse and worse over time. I went on there. There was just there was a thread about anarcho primitivism or something like state, like general the industrial revolution and its consequences have been a disaster for the human race type thread, and I was like maybe I'll find some interesting arguments in here. Right, because I'm interested in both primitivism and like non-primitivism. I like I I I like, you know, maybe someone will bring up Nix. Hello from the Wired is literally a synthesis of primitivism and transhumanism. There's nothing like cyber nihilism. There's nothing more Lane Chan than that. Like that's the no one posted it. No one had anything interesting to say. Everyone was just shouting at each other, completely like a fucking stupid idiot. They weren't saying anything reasonable or sensible at all. It was completely stupid discussion. Everyone thinks they're a genius and thinks they know what they're talking about. No one knows what they're talking about on any side of the argument. Even like even people who are ostensibly making good points that I would agree with are making those points so terribly that I don't want to agree with them because no one knows what the fuck they're talking about. I think anyone who was actually decent to the site left in like 2017, uh, by, by 2017, and the site has just been shit ever since. But the only decent thread is the the desktop thread. It has always been the only decent thread on Lane Chan. Well, it, like, it's always the thing like, well, Lane Chan's always going to have the best desktop thread because it's a thread about people who like serious films as Lane. They understand how to make a desktop look good. Like, that's the only thing Lane Chan is good for is the desktop thread. Um, and I'm sure tech is, like, tech and the, the coding, the programming um, board, the programming board is probably good if you care about that stuff which I don't know how to do any programming or anything. There was a moment when Lane Chan was the best image board, right? But I think the problem is that, that cyberpunk itself has lost its cultural significance. And so an image board that is completely based around cyberpunk is just falling apart because it, has, it doesn't have anywhere to exist in culture. Uh, it was destined to fall apart. It, it's not necessarily that the site was invaded by normies, like tends to be the cycle of websites. Like, no, it it actually had a pretty unique way of dying. It died because its basis got left behind by the rest of the world, um, which is ironic for cyberpunk, which is like a science fiction genre, to now be too um, historical for anyone to care about, for culture to move beyond that. Uh, that's definitely interesting. Someone should create uh, acceleration... Uh, uh, ACC's chat or something, like an accelerationist image board or something like that, that, that won't fall out of favor so easily. Although I think an accelerationist image board would fall out of favor pretty easily. There was for a very brief time Zero Chan, right? Which there's like, there's 20 different Zero Chans. There was a Zero Chan that was an anarchist based image board and was run by Nix, as far as I understand, coincidentally, because I was just talking about her. And it was great. It was amazing. There was really high quality discussion. It, it was just generally great. And then uh, Nyx just killed it. She just didn't want to keep running it, um, which is fair, I guess. It's kind of annoying to upkeep an image board. But uh, that's a bit of a shame. Um, I, I don't know what a good image board anymore. I mean, Sushi Chan's still chugging on. Um, and I've been going on X lately, but I wouldn't call X, like 4chan, the board X. I, I wouldn't call X a good image board. Like it's kind of the reason I am browsing it is because it's bad, and it, it gives me a place to schizo post, right? Where no one will, you know. Well, no, people will call me a retard. That's kind of the fun of it. Um, yeah.
uh, sushi chan's always good. I don't think sushi chan's ever not going to be good because keeping it comfy is good. Um, and it doesn't like I'm actually surprised that it doesn't seem to be like dying ever. It like I always assumed that a, a, a place this slow would just slowly die, but no, like it's just had a consistent but small user base this whole time, and it's user it's small enough that there's never really any problems. I mean, even the main guy who owned it just fucking ran away into the mountains or killed himself or something, and someone else just took it over, and there was basically never any problems with it. Um, it was just a little odd for a while. Uh, so Sushi Chan, but so you can't main Sushi Chan because it's way too slow. You can't like spend a day on here. It's it's because it's like there's maybe five posts a day. Obviously, One Chan is the best image board objectively. That that one's never gonna go to shit. This is a perfect example of my principle that a um, uh, if you want a community uh, that you know if your community needs gatekeeping, then you already fucked up because you didn't base it around something that gatekeeps itself. Well, train autism gatekeeps itself, and so you don't get any bad posts on one chan, and it can keep chugging on for fucking twenty years or however long it's been going. Uh, yeah, there's obviously certain small boards that, 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 that like, there's no decent, uh, maybe 420chan, like, 420chan, it, it always has shit, like, it's always kind of shit, but it's never, like, it's always its own brand of shit. 420chan's, like, its whole own um, ecosystem. It's ho it's like a whole separate biome on the internet. Like, it's it's like a, it descended from 4chan and whatever, but it's just its own thing now. Um and it's been its own thing forever, uh, and it's it just developed its own. Like, everything is just... When you go on 420chan, you, like, it's familiar yet different, you know? <laughs> it's great. Um, and it's also mainly nowadays, you know, even though you think, like, oh, 420chan, but I don't do drugs. The 420chan is mostly a professional wrestling and Star Trek forum. <laughs> like, if you like Star Trek, the, the Star Trek world on 420chan is the best place on the internet to talk about Star Trek. Um by by a, a a long shot because everyone just loves it and um everyone knows way more about it than i do which is how you know you're in a good community when you're the dumbest person there um like that's what you want from a nerd community right you want to be the stupidest person you want everyone else to have more knowledge than you that's that's just great and i don't know anything about professional wrestling but apparently people have a good discussion here Um, and obviously drugs that's also fun but it's just fun like it's, it's not no one takes it ser well some people take it serious uh, maybe the psych uh, psychedelic board takes it a bit too seriously but no one else takes it seriously and that's fun uh, and obviously stay away from slash weed like that's a, that's a dog shit board but like why would you ever go on there Uh, Dali is like one of my favorite places on the whole internet because it's just a bunch of insane people who do deliriums all the time and are just like addicted to del like that's a very unique place. I love that shit basically. Um, so yeah, 420 chan is always good, but it's also I I don't think I could main it. Like I don't think you, it, it's just not 4chan. 4chan is great because you can post in the thread and within a minute you get five replies calling. I mean, all of them are calling you a retard, but at least you get some replies. You post on Sushi Chan and you'll be lucky if anyone replies to you in the next week. And Sushi Chan's relatively big. Uh, which is fine because if any, Sushi Chan was any bigger, it would lose its comfiness. Like, yeah, not good. Uh, but they're basically image boards are like kind of dead to me. I just don't, I, like, even though I think they're one of the best formats for discussion on the internet, I just, um, haven't like I'm just not as into them as I was once. I just I think they've lost a bit of their grip on on the zeitgeist, if it were as it were, which is not necessarily a bad thing. Um, and I'm you know these days I I really struggle to find stuff to do on the internet that isn't bullshit. I mean there's basically like a lot of stuff I used to do on the internet was 
focused around discussion. Whereas now, I've sort of pinholed myself into two different directions, where there's one side of the internet like YouTube, which is just for input, and then one side of the internet like um, online games and uh, Matrix, which is just for output. Uh, and then, or again, kind of YouTube and making YouTube videos, which is just for output. But like browsing, I don't have a sort of conversational browsing habits like I did when I was really into image boards. Um, which I don't know if that's a good or bad thing. On the one hand, being really into image boards was a good way to listen to a lot of music because you you know you put on an album in the background and next thing you know you've spent twelve hours listening to music and fucking around on. Uh, 4chan uh, but yeah I just I find difficult thing. I find it difficult to think of things to do these days on the internet um, which is fine I've got Sengoku Rants I've got CSGO I've got Matrix to talk to my friends I don't necessarily, and I'm you know I've got books and shit to read but I know I know that I'm in a, a you know manic ish period right now where I can actually pay attention to information but I know once I slip back into depression, I'm just going to have nothing to do. Because if it's a bad day, like today was a bad day for YouTube. The harvest wasn't good today, right? Let me walk you through the YouTube harvest today. So let me find the last post that I, the last video I watched before bed last night. Or the, I didn't watch it, but the last video I saw before bed last night was this one. 18 hours ago, really good scrambled eggs by J. Kenji Lopez out. Um, great cooking channel, by the way. If, uh, you probably know him already. He's pretty well known. Uh, and then I went to bed, and then by the time I woke up, all I all that had been posted was like that much. This video by Noko from Shinsei Gamashan, which I don't know why I'm subscribed to him because I can't understand anything he says. It's all in Japanese. This, which is by Bet Off Dead, which is just like a weird one minute long thing, an entire C stream, um, an Ololilia post, but. Uh, Oh, I actually somehow I missed this. Oh, this is this is just the same one of his um one of his songs that he's made, but slowed down seventy five percent. I've already heard this song. I remember now. Uh, this like there's basically three videos, and only one of them is really going to be worth watching, which is the Southy One one. And then it's like okay, so then what? Okay, we get one disguised toast video, barely worth watching. One corridor crew video, fucking clickbait bullshit. I don't like. I'm on again. Corridor crew. Is, corridor is another example of a channel I'm only subscribed to because I've been watching them since I was a kid, and so I'm just invested in them as human beings. Uh, and I know they will just consistently put out content that is meets the criteria of being coherently watchable, even if it adds absolutely nothing to my life. And then, there is nothing interesting gets posted. GDQ, random game, don't give a fuck. Source run on a random Half-Life mod, don't give a fuck. A generic CSGO frag, uh, frag video, don't give a fuck. Just a guy riding a horse for like 30 seconds per video, a giveaway announcement, don't give a fuck. Some grime stuff, like a Sir Spiral, like his beats are good, but none of these people are particularly good MCs in my opinion. A Corpse Husband video, like again, nothing positive. A symbol for this video, the highlight of my day, this was a good video. Mumbo Jumbo, I don't care anymore. I've sort of lost interest in Hermitcraft as the seasons progressed. Um, Escape through video, that's decent, you know, because sort of, the, the now we're getting back into it, but earlier, said, like, that was three hours ago, this Escape through video and the Mumbo video and the Simple Flips video came out, but I had, like, so long with just nothing to do. I mean, I was just listening to my David Graeber audiobook, but, uh, like, there was, like, hours where there was just, like, the harvest today was shit. Right, and we get a few good, decent videos, right? But you watch them, and now there's nothing again. Well, Chase Tag, why am I even subscribed to these guys? I never watch their shit. Life in Jars, actually, that's pretty interesting. Put that in my watch later. Another random GDQ video I don't give a fuck about on a live stream. Like, there's no fuck all to watch. This, I can't keep, this won't keep me entertained all day. It's just not possible. But, and you might think, well, you can't keep entertained all day with just YouTube. But the thing is, on a good harvest, if I get lucky with a good harvest, I can keep entertained the whole day with just YouTube. And it's great. Like, I I actually feel... Well, I don't feel fulfilled. <laughs> That's definitely not true. But um, I feel like, you know, it's not boring. There we go. It's not boring. That's pretty much the basic 
um, requirement. I have no idea how I ended up talking about that from image boards. I said something about how I'm not going to call this late capitalism, like this term late capitalism is stupid, and that I will call what we live in now capitalism and what Marx analyzed proto-capitalism. And uh, this is actually a very helpful way of thinking about things because, uh, you know, with, with, when when you read like capitalist realism and you watch hyper normalization and stuff, these similar vibes, you know, even uh, society of the spectacle, uh, stuff like that, you get this idea that like, oh, we had this chance to defeat capitalism, but now capitalism feels like there's no alternative. It feels unquestionable, uh, uh, right? But we can look at, at that in like a similar way to, well, after the French Revolution and consequent liberal revolutions that produced capitalism, there were still plenty of places in the world that didn't live under capitalism. There were lots of other places that were feudal or some other for, sort of the feudal adjacent system that couldn't necessarily be called capitalism. Uh, and there still were, and there still are, in fact, many places like that. Um, but they still were a big deal for a long time, well into the last century. Um, you know, now it's sort of, you got them dotted around in various places, but, and they're slowly sort of becoming, well, they might not be slowly sort of becoming capitalist. In fact, they definitely are not in certain areas. But what I mean to say is, even after capitalism, there, like, first happened, there was still bits of feudalism left over in the same way that, as I presume, that when feudalism became a thing, there was still, and, you know, in fact, still are various hunter-gatherer societies <laughs> or, you know, when agriculture could take over, there are still various hunter-gatherer societies around the world. Um, doesn't mean that it's not possible to still be a hunter-gatherer. Many people still do. The Khoisan people, for example, still practice a hunter-gatherer lifestyle that may have existed since the beginning of humanity. Um, so just because, and, you know, then eventually more and more places became under feudalism until the world had this sort of global feudalism, right? And at the time, it seemed like the divine right of kings was unquestionable. You know, no one would have, no one would have, you know, 500 years into feudalism or whatever, 200 years into feudalism, let's say, people would probably not, you know, they might be a bit pissed off with their king, but the divine right of kings, it didn't seem like it was going to fall anytime soon, but it did eventually. And even under feudalism, there were still plenty of, um, you know, people who weren't living under, there were pe plenty of people living under slavery and serfdom and similar situations, but there were plenty of people who were not. And I'm talking about peasant class, not, um, you know, aristocracy. There were, there were people who lived pretty good lives by any standard. Many people who lived pretty good lives by any standard. And, uh, you know, even there was resistance constantly pretty much peasant uprisings across all of history all of feudalism there was um you know um also what's the word like independent civilizations independent societies that sort of you know booted the king out or whatever and just sort of lived independently again across the world without feudalism even though the divine right of kings seemed like something that you couldn't really question in the same way that capitalism seems right now like something you can't really question and that there's no hope for a global socialist revolution or whatever you guys want, right? But, again, that's because we're still relatively in the early stages. That's how it's... Now, we're now okay, it's there now. You know, anything before that was really just like the very beginning, the very early parts of capitalism when it still hadn't fully established itself as the strongest option, right? And so, of course... There were lots of people who thought, well, we can do socialism, we can do this type of communism, we can do anarcho-syndicalism in Catalonia or whatever, like, and they seemed like they genuinely had a chance. Um, but now neoliberal capitalism and you know, similar types of systems or adjacent types of systems of capitalism uh, you know, run the world and there is no actually existing socialism. Well, there, there might be, but it's, it's disguised and it's kind of weird. It's a, bit, it's a bit of a weird situation going on there. Well, that's because we've now entered capitalism proper. It does, that's not really a cause for massive concern, 
um, especially with upcoming, you know, events that will seriously threaten capital's dominance over society, such as um, the climate crisis, uh, which will basically make capitalism untenable in certain parts of the world and stretch it to its limits in others. Uh, you know, I'm honestly not too worried about it anymore. I was for a bit. And hey, maybe, I, I'm not saying global capitalism is going to collapse, but there is no global capitalism. There never has been and there never will be. <laughs> Um, I, you know, I'm not saying there, there's going to be a simultaneous global communist revolution and then we'll all be living under luxury space communism. No, that's never going to happen. That's ridiculous. I'm not saying anarchism either. I'm not saying, oh, there's going to be great anarchist revolutions and we're all going to be living in an anarchist utopia. No. But just because one system seems like it can't be changed doesn't has never meant that it actually can't be changed. It just means that it has a lot of influence right now. Um just because capitalism kind of feels like it can't be challenged, oftentimes, yet when it is actually challenged, those challenges are overlooked because they don't draw attention to themselves. Like, for example, imagine you're a little community, rural community in the middle of some African nation, for example, or South American nation. Um, you're a sort of rural community, and, you know, you're... You, the, the government pretty much has no influence on your lives, right? You, the police don't really bother coming around there. You maintain your own roads. There's none, nothing, you know, none of that really takes place there. You just sort of, the government pretty much has no influence on your day-to-day -day life. And so one day you and your, you know, neighbors and the community just decide to stop paying taxes. And the government doesn't really notice. They don't really care. And they think like, oh, well, it's probably just more hassle than it's worth. Well, just fuck it, you know? Maybe they, they just do a vague display of force and you fight the police off a couple times or whatever and they just sort of say eh fuck it not really worth pouring our resources to get one little tiny village to pay taxes eh right you know then they won't cause any trouble um or maybe they just never notice in the first place or maybe you continue paying taxes right? but the government just generally has no say in your life you know you as a community just uh do things yourselves without <laughs> without them interfering uh even though you may still pay taxes or you may not none of that matters really what matters is the one thing you're not going to do is set up a big flag that says we're communist rebels we're anarchist rebels right you're not going to announce it to the global media or anything like that because doing that is basically saying to the government well now you have to shut us down because no government is going to just allow that like now now what you've done is you've made yourself you've made you've put the government you put the state in a position where it can't ignore you anymore, right? So no one's going to ever do that. No one's going to draw attention to themselves like that. They're just going to keep it on the down low and just get on with their lives because that's what they want to do this whole time. Um, you know, maybe your community uh, still has money but doesn't use it very often. You know, maybe you still have money when you go into the city and you buy things and you still sell your products for money to people occasionally, but most of the time you just sort of, give stuff to each other whenever people need it in a sort of mutual aid type system or a, a, a sort of abstract credit debt type situation, right? Um, again, there's no reason to draw attention to it. You probably wouldn't even think anything of it if that was just how people did things around, like maybe if you're rural farmers and that's the way it's been done for generations and you just never bothered to change, like, or maybe you decided to go back to it or maybe you decided to, either way, no one's ever going to notice unless you go there and figure it out yourself. So I, I think this is very common around the world, particularly in the third world. I, I think this is incredibly common. And I think it's even common in cities, in urban centers, like in the first world, even similar things happen. And, so, and they're always happening. Honestly, I, I, I feel like there's, there's many reasons to be pessimistic. Climate collapse will kill many people. Capitalism and endless war will continue to kill many people. Uh, the advances of technology with AI and brain-computer interfaces will probably spell disaster for many different situations. The rich are going to flee to Mars and so on and so on. But it's not like the situation is completely hopeless. I wonder if we'll get to the point where I'll just refuse to use Discord. Maybe I'll get to the point where I just refuse to use YouTube or anything. With, maybe I'll get to the point where I refuse to, uh, to use a website that you has non-free JavaScript on it. Maybe I'll just install Libra, the new Libra.js and never view non-free JavaScript ever again. I don't think it will get to that point, but, but maybe it will.
I could inst- I sh- maybe I should no, that's that's not worth it. I'll just get pissed off when it happens and think if only I could have done something about this. <laughs> um On the one hand it's like I really only have the three online friends, right? The the the, the main the main four of the Dempermob universe in my eyes, right? Me, uh Plunder, Carla and Star. Right. Um and that's pretty much the only people I talk to on the internet, uh in general. I mean in, in you know, it's a bit more complicated than that, but we can just simplify to that. Over Discord, let's say that. They're only pretty much the only people I talk to over Discord. There are a few other people I talk to occasionally, but pretty much ninety nine percent of my conversations with those people. But for all of those people, the reverse isn't true. Um all of them have people have like a bunch of other friends on Discord that they talk to much more often than I talk to any of my other Discord contacts. And uh so making the jump to Matrix entirely from Discord is they have a lot more to lose, let's just say. Right? Like they uh whereas I uh, can be pretty certain that, you know, okay, well, uh, all I have to do is convince these three people to follow me, and then I'm I'm good, I'm Gucci, I'm sitting pretty. They are like, well, I have the whole fucking levels of social fucking community around me that I have to somehow, you know, do I just have constantly have Discord open for everyone and then Matrix open for just no thank you <laughs> because he's autistic and refuses to use Discord? Like, uh, I know I don't want to impre- um, Im- impose on people. The other day I said impeach on people, and then I was like, hold on a minute, that's not the right word. But it was too late to correct myself by the time I realized that I said the wrong word. Maybe impeach is the right word. I don't know. But yeah, I feel a bit guilty about that. But on the other hand, I feel like it's kind. Of, it's kind of hypocritical of me to not to continue using Discord. Like it's just a little too hypocr. It's the, the the hypocrisy just becomes a little too obvious to me. As in, <clears throat> you know, the way social movements happen these days is reversed to how they you know used to happen. That like it used to be. You, or the idea behind it, at least. You know, it used to be you have your violent revolution where you fight with the police and the state or whatever, and then after you've done that, you have a, a big celebration, and then after, and you you know, you set up your festivals and you do whatever, feasts, festivals, parties, and then after that, you, you know, start setting up democratic institutions or whatever to run your new society, and then you go about instituting actual social change that impacts people's everyday life. But in, but now, the way things are done is the reverse. You start by direct action um, impacting social change. And then you set up democratic institutions to sort of manage that direct action and or organize it more accurately. And then you set up and then, you know, then you have a party, then you set up festivals and stuff to get people together and, you know, and celebration and stuff like that. That's why whenever you go to a protest, there's always people like hippies with drum circles and whatever. It's really annoying, but whatever. Like, uh, uh, yeah. And then after the after you set up at your such so trying to have a festival or to have any type of fun... Then of course the police come down and just come come over, and then you have the battle with the police as they try and shut you down, and then uh, you know you win or you lose or whatever. Like it's done in the complete reverse way, and so right now I'm trying to do the first step, which is first thing you do is you enact social change that, that directly impacts people's lives, right? And that for me means. 
um, you know, moving away from capitalism, and that means moving away from corporatized internet. Um, yeah, moving towards free software. Like, I think about... Really, capitalism plays very little role in my life. <laughs> like, you know my song, Do Drugs, Read Manga, Drop Out? I basically just did that. I dropped, I put, like, the only times capitalism plays a, plays a role in my life is um, when I have to pay rent uh, and when I ha when something breaks and I have to buy a replacement for it. Other than those two situations, nothing... Oh, well, I guess food. <laughs> food as well. Other than those three things, capitalism plays very little role in my life, in my day-to-day -day social interactions. Like, for example, exchanging um, products with my friends, right? Uh, when, for example, if I'm like, oh, I made this beat and I want Plunder to rap over it, for example, right? There's no money that changes hands or anything. I just say, hey, would you contribute your product of your labor? Because labor, making art is a product of labor, right? So I'm like, hey, would you just do that for me? And then Plunder's like, yeah, sure, no, 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 no worries. And then Plunder sends me a verse, or vice versa. You know, Plunder's like, hey, will you hop on this? And I'm like, sure, I'll hop on this. And then through mutual aid and free exchange and all of these things without money even entering the picture, we just, you know, exchange the products of our labor very efficiently and freely, and money never has to play a role in it, which is great. I wish the whole world could work like that. Um, and it probably could, or in some way, similar to that. As you probably noticed I'm um, on a bit with David Graeber Binge right now and I'm watching this random debate he had with Peter Thiel, Peter Thiel the, the other guy that made PayPal along with Elon Musk um, I, I, I don't know what they're really supposed to be talking about, they're just sort of having a vague debate, it's honestly not that much of a good debate It's it's uh, clearly Graeber isn't getting to talk about the stuff he wants. Neither of them are getting to talk about the stuff they want to talk about because neither of them really know what they're supposed to be talking about. But um, this is one place where I, you know, I wish I was the guy counter-debating Peter Thiel instead of uh, Graeber because, you know, Graeber is a great anthropologist and a great, you know, he knows a lot about ways to organize society and blah, blah, blah. But when they're talking about the tech sector and, you know, uh, how best to organize society in order to maximize technological innovation, David Graeber doesn't really know what he's talking about. Uh, neither does Peter Thiel. But I know some stuff about that. Not that much. I'm not a genius. But Peter Thiel basically says at some point, um, he, he said something along the lines of, well, you know, in Silicon Valley, there have been many experiments with companies that, uh, you know, maybe are very transparent and, uh, you know, or less hierarchical people, like more democratic. So, and, so, and these companies tend to fail, and it's the author actually the scarily authoritarian ones that tend to actually succeed in developing an innovative product like that's what the actual evidence shows um and david graber sort of you know he gives an answer about st other stuff like he he gives a decent counter argument but if i was there i could just say well like what are you talking about <laughs> like that's just not true if you look at the majority of things that come out of silicon valley tech startups they aren't even real products like most of them just exist to get bought up by an existing big company um, and then they fade into non-existence. Uh, either that or they're incredibly inefficient. They have a terrible business model for the consumer where they steal and sell the data to third parties 
uh, and or, or like overall exploit the end user for profit. Um, and they're mostly bloated and terrible. Uh, the actual technologies that get created, especially when it comes to software. Uh, you know, I, I don't know much about hardware development, but software development in Silicon Valley has been terrible for a very long time. You, you know, you end up with this bullshit. And the best software coming out of the world right now, the most efficiently written, best programmed, most secure, most stable software, the software the entire internet runs on, is Linux, is free free open source software is suckless dw not dwm but like suckless for example all all of these um free open source softwares which are written very efficiently by incredibly talented people for free and um available open source for free, like freely where you can modify them however you want um and you know linux doesn't have the world, the biggest market share in the world but it's the more successful than uh any other OS except Mac OS and uh, Windows, you know, if you take away Mac and Windows, it's the most, third most successful OS, and it's also very different than Mac and Windows, and has a lot of other advantages, for example, you know, most of the web runs on Linux, as I said, uh, and also Linux is perfectly good like i use it every single day and it's great and i've never had any problem well you know i've had some problems with it also had some problems with mac and windows but overall i would say my experience with linux has been better um so there's an instant counter argument to well the more authoritarian structures always come out on top they just don't the more authoritarian structures end up producing terrible products like mac os and bloated products like windows I mean, Mac is also bloated, but you just end up with a, with a bunch of bullshit. Uh, and half the time, they produce a product that barely exists in any form other than a vague promise to venture capitalists, uh, which is really their purpose in the first place. Because that they they the the business the actual business model of the tech startups is to get bought out and then you know take the money and run. Whereas, uh, and then whatever software gets created at the end. It is uh, designed to be uh, to use the consumer as the product, right? You know, they say if, if you if you don't have to pay for it, you're the product. Um, you know, that's how that's the business model of the entire fucking tech sector right now, uh, except for free open source software uh, like Linux. Hyperpop was a weird fucking like reaction to like uh, pop, uh, I'll call it pop depression over saturation. So, you know, people like Post Malone, Lil Uzi Vert, uh, the other guy, Juice World, like all of these like pop, these like super popular, Billy Eilish even, you know, these super popular emo bullshit type of pop stars. Um, and a hyper pop, who would, you know, it's all like low key and, and shit. And so the hyperpop was like a reaction to that, but um, it wasn't aware enough of the fact that there was a reaction to that, and so now it's just sort of ended up recreating a lot of those tropes. Um, like a lot of it's just sort of become emo, and uh, I don't know, I don't know about that. For some reason, I'd convinced myself that this video was awful, that, like, I'd run out of things to talk about at some point between the last video and this video, and then this was all just filler. But I just re-watched every single clip that I've recorded so far, and it's about the same standard as the old ones. So I don't know what I was on about in my head. I just want to give a quick counter to Young Dodsmite's video here, just a real quick addition to her point rather than a counter. She says something along the lines of, if you want to rebel in what she calls meta-modernity, I, I, I don't know what that phrase is supposed to mean, but, I mean, whatever. <laughs> if you want to rebel in, in meta-modernity, the only option is to desire things that are so, like... Just basically desire as little as possible and then just drop out and become a neat right and on the one hand i agree but on the other hand i disagree and the reason is um somewhat of a zizek type of type of position right 
uh, or something that Zizek talks about often, which is that actually among like the managerial classes, CEOs and such like, the most popular attitude right now, you know, in the, the current world is not, you know, like it was once, maybe some sort of puritanical Christian or maybe a sort of enlightenment atheist um, reason, scientism. The most popular sort of attitude is, is uh, pseudo Zen Buddhist, right? To, to let go of desire. Uh, and he, you know, Zizek talks about how um, among armies, Zen Buddhism was actually very popular uh, because, uh, you know, it's actually very hard to convince yourself to kill someone. But under the Buddhist logic, you can just sort of convince yourself, oh, you know, we're all part of this cosmic dance. And in that cosmic dance, my sword goes through his chest, but it's all transient anyway, and so on and so on. Sniff, sniff. Um, and, you know, I think Dotsmite's basically just rehashing the similar sort of argument that, um, yes, on the one hand, as an individual, um, avoiding consumerism, dropping out and not contributing to capitalism is a good thing, pretty objectively. It also is the same. It's also only only slightly better than doing nothing. Um, that it's a... It's good, right? It's a good thing to do for your personal, like for yourself as an individual, but it doesn't um, change the world in any way. And really the best way to rebel is, as it always has been, via direct action. Um, it's just a matter of figuring out what action is the best way to be direct. Um, you know, this is this is often been the case, but is now very obviously the case. Um, you know, protest movements and etc. Uh, seem seem pretty useless right now. Uh, they you know they get surface level shit done. They get lib lib shit done, but they don't get anything done for real. And um, you know, forming a socialist group and going you know that's all bullshit. We all know that forming a vanguard party or whatever. <laughs> like, that's ridiculous. Like, the best option, if you actually want to rebel, and seriously, is direct action. Uh, and I feel like dropping out and becoming a neat is m more like um, another form of anarchy where... Uh, it's sort of a direct action on your own life, right? It's it's turning the the um, social struggle inwards towards yourself and freeing yourself, which is good. It's better than not freeing yourself, but it doesn't help anyone else, and it doesn't uh, work forever. And also, eventually, as this becomes a more common occurrence, which it most likely will become a more common occurrence, uh, as automation takes over and such like, um, and, you know, jobs become harder to come by due to various economic and technological reasons, um, governments will figure out a way to stop us from doing this. Um, it's only a matter of time, really. Uh, it may happen within the next five years. It may not happen for the next 50 years, but it may, you know, we just don't know. Uh, and uh, at that point, it's all very well and good to forgo desire in this sort of Buddhist way, but uh, that is a, a a good way to ignore the way that systems affect your life. And I'm not saying you're morally obligated to do direct action or whatever. You're definitely not. Um, I'm just saying that, that that's uh, simply do drugs with manga drop out is not actually uh, the only or best way to rebel. Uh, that's the only counterpoint I'm making. It's a, it, like it's it's a, it's good. It's a net positive, but it's not uh, the best way. If you're talking about rebelling, it's not the best way. You can't. What what the fuck just happened? Look at what comes next to the fucking video. Wait, listen. To clarify a few things about that previous rant, 
because I knew, like, no, thank you. That's probably already responded to it in, like, a his next video. What? How did she know? Where I don't mean... How did she know? What the fuck? Am I that predictable? I'm, oh, my God. What the fuck? What the fuck? What the, that was... I seriously had not seen that clip. I just paused it, recorded a fucking response to it, and then I get fucking called out. I get called the fuck out immediately. Oh my god, my entire self is collapsing. So let me explain the situation I'm in right now. So it is 5 a.m. Uh, I have class at 9, but I should be asleep right now, according to my sleep schedule. Like, I should be falling asleep roughly about now. Um, and my mum said <laughs> that if I'm not in my Zoom lesson at nine and she's awake, that she'll throw water on me and wake me up. Now, that would be bad, <laughs> right? I don't want that. I don't know if she'd actually do it. She probably wouldn't actually throw water on me, but she would come in and wake me up. She tried to do that today, and she succeeded, but fortunately due to having extensive experience with this, when I used to live at my dad's, I'm very good with at sleeping uh, once all the lights have been turned. To sum up a, lo a long history of um, sleep warfare, when I used to live with my dad, uh, specifically my stepmom, um, they used to every day, you know, like come into my room, throw the curtains open, turn all the lights on, and, you know, shout at me, et cetera, et cetera. But they couldn't physically drag me out of bed. Uh, so I got very good at, um, you know, sleeping, going back to sleep after all that, sleeping even though all the lights were on, you know, I, I figured out various techniques and stuff. So I managed to fall back to sleep. But it's not ideal, and I don't think, you know, there's whatever, it doesn't matter. But the point is that um, I'm not gonna get four hours sleep tonight that's not an option i have my class is from nine to eleven um i don't think i'm gonna stay up to eleven i think that's a bit too far-fetched i mean i probably could if i stopped like to start slamming back coffees right now but i don't feel like doing that like my fucking health my mental state and my physical state is just not in a place where i can Oh, I feel like that's appropriate right now. Um, so my goal is to basically st my my goal time is nine thirty. My goal time is to be in is to catch the first half hour of the lecture. Hopefully that's long enough for my mom to come and notice I'm in the lecture and not you know stab me in the face. Um, and then keep the zoom on just in the background while I and then just you know go to sleep at like nine thirty or something. Um, and this is a whole weird situation because I've got to manage my alcohol consumption. I've got to manage my awakeness. So I have no option to consume caffeine, by the way. That's not true. I actually do have options to consume caffeine, but I also don't in a very complicated set of circumstances. So I took a 200 milligrams of caffeine at around, oh, let me see, two-ish? Maybe one thirty. I don't remember exactly. Uh, maybe it was even earlier than that. Maybe it was that. Oh no, it was actually earlier than that. It was actually about uh, midnight. Maybe maybe like half past midnight. Um, so that should be wearing down. You know that that should all be out of my system in an hour. In which case I'll be operating on um, running on empty as as it were. Uh, and the problem is that caffeine. Uh, although I have a high tolerance to caffeine and it doesn't really get me super stimulated uh, anymore, it does make sleeping hard um, for me. Like, it just it, it just makes it so that, like, I'll lie down. I still feel tired, but when I lie down, I just can't get to sleep, which is not a fun state to be in when you have my brain. Um, I'm sure many of you can relate to that. You don't want to be lying down trying to get to sleep, but really tired but unable to when you have... Um, a brain uh, in, you know, the certain modality. The, no one wants to experience that. So caffeine is really not an option. Now, there was possibly the option of just having a small amount of caffeine, perhaps by drinking some uh, Pepsi of some kind, but we have no Pepsi of any kind. So I guess, and I guess I could have a cup of tea,
but I think I think I'm going to avoid caffeine and just stick to pure willpower uh, and autism. Um, but you know, there's only a certain level of suffering I'm willing to take sober. So I'm also going to have to try and manage my alcohol consumption because I don't want to be um, too drunk that it makes me tired, but I want to be drunk enough that the tiredness isn't as suffering for me. So I have to, and also I don't want to start drinking too early because as I've explained before, if I start drinking too early, my I, I get all fucked up. Like if I, if I drink, right, and I'm still awake about five hours later, um, depending on various weird factors that I don't understand, um, it makes, like, uh, my, my heart will start pounding, I'll get a terrible headache, my throat will go dry, my mouth will go, it's not good, it's not fun, you don't want to be there. Uh, no matter how much water I drink, by the way, or any, don't suggest stuff like that. The only thing I found that sometimes helps is eating a meal halfway through. Sometimes that helps, but sometimes it doesn't. I haven't figured it out, and I don't want to, I don't want to experiment to figure it out, because it's a really unpleasant experience, so instead I just always start drinking four to five hours before I go to sleep. That way I never have to, you know, I sleep through that whole time period and then I, everything's fine. Um, yeah. Why was I talking about this? Oh, yeah. So basically that's the situation I'm in right now is I'm, I'm trying to catch my Zoom lecture. Now, the most interesting thing about this is that um, I've just recently been thinking about the nature of that, like school and academia and stuff, like university. And, like, the reason I'm in uni is so fucking weird, because I'm not in uni to learn anything at all, right? I, I've i learned about three things in my three years at uni from, from lectures. I learned one very minor EQing technique, which I barely ever use, um, but it is useful when, it, when I need to use it. Um, I've learned a little bit about mastering, not as much as I would have wanted to learn, but... Uh, my uni is not that great. Um, and I've learned a little bit about how to mic up like actual instruments, which I will never use because I don't have a fucking, I don't work in a studio or I don't have a good home studio. Um, I think that's about everything that I learned <laughs> in my fucking three years of university that wasn't self-study. So I learned a lot about Tob and Gristle when I decided to write a paper about them or whatever in in first year, um, but that wasn't anything that my lecturers taught me. So, you know, that, that sort of thing I learned about, but nothing that my lecturers taught me was ever very useful. Um, and, you know, in a normal situation, uh, I, that's stupid, right? Why am I, like, I realized that it never even occurred to me that you should go to university to learn something. And the only reason I started thinking about it is because, you know me, I like to read up on philosophy and, and stuff. Like, I was talking to my dad about the fact that I've been trying to understand Deleuze uh, and failing, by the way, completely. It's fucking completely beyond me. Um, and he kept asking, like, oh, so why are you using this for your dissertation? Like, where is it, did you get asked to study it for uni? Like, no, I just decided to do it because I thought it was interesting. Um, and I realized, like, oh, most people who are into philosophy are into philosophy via university. I guess a lot of people in my uni, learn everything they know about music through uni, not through YouTube tutorials and trial and error. But they're all worse at making music than I am. Not all of them. That's okay. That's a gen that's a massive generalization. Most of them are, you know, we're all about the same skill level. Some of them are better than me at certain aspects. You know, like some people who, who particularly want to work in a studio environment, working with like artist as a sort of studio engineer are much better at that stuff than I am because I've never had a chance to practice it and it's never been very interesting to me. Some people who are really focused on like EDM sound design stuff are better at that than I am. Again, never really been my special my speciality. But, you know, I'm probably I would just not to toot my own horn or anything. Uh, I'm definitely tooting my own horn. I as far as everything I've heard from people in my class, I'm probably one of the better uh, you know, composers and arrangers and songwriters out of my production class, uh, just because that's the stuff that actually, you know, that's just my area of expertise as well, what I specialize in. But uh, what's surprising is the fact that I did that, that, you know, it basically had no effect on me. 
uni had no effect on my ability to um, make music. All of that was pretty much these days just me learning it by myself through experience. And um, I was just thinking about how, you know, at one point universities existed to actually spread knowledge. But now universities exist as a business, right? But they're a weird business because no one's really sure what the product is. Is the product the students or is the product the educa- like the lessons and the education and whatever? No one's really sure. Like, is the product... If you imagine, if you're running the university as a business, then it has to be selling a product. So is the product the, the students with the degree or is the product the information that you tell the student? Like, it somehow tries to be both and neither at the same time. It's, it's a very strange situation. Uh, but I, I kind of need the qualifications. Um, but then also, like, I know the qualifications are bullshit. Like, I know that having a music degree doesn't help anyone in life. <laughs> Like why would I, why would I need a degree in music production? Who's going to hire me based on that? It's nonsense, you know. Even, especially in the music industry, where it's not about what you know, it's about who you know. It's one of those sort of situations, and it's probably I would assume they'd be more willing to hire someone who is better at you know the making music than someone who has a degree. That's what actually matters. Sorry, it's my vape once again. I'm so. Looking forward to getting a new one that isn't fucking cylindrical and doesn't fall over all the time. But yeah, the idea of going to uni to actually start, like, to actually gain information from teachers, is just a baffling concept to me. And the idea of going to school to learn anything is a baffling concept to me. I don't think I've ever learned anything in school. <laughs> I literally don't think I've ever learned anything in school. Everything I've learned has been because I've wanted to learn it and I've done my own independent research into it. Um, And maybe sometimes that means that I get a less whole picture of the situation. Maybe sometimes it's better to learn from the experts. But, you know, uh, oftentimes it just doesn't make that much of a difference. Um, And I, I don't really know what the point I'm getting at is here. I don't know if I have one particularly, but, uh, there you go. I'm going to my Zoom classes just to show up, just to appease my mum so she doesn't throw water over me and get my bed wet and get my computer wet. Um, and she would do that because she thinks that going to class would affect my ability to learn, when in fact it doesn't affect my ability to learn. But she thinks that going to class will affect my ability to do my work, really. She doesn't want me to learn. She just wants me to do the work, Uh, as in, like, the assignments, the the assessments, rather. But really, you know, for example, last year I got a distinction in a class that I only went to one lesson of. Uh, So it really doesn't matter if I actually go in or not. None of it really matters. None of this makes any sense. It's all just a fucking completely absurd situation to be in. All right, the tiredness is really starting to hit. What time is it? 5.30? Okay, good. We can, we can have a beer. But my brain is really like, what the fuck? Why are all the lights still on? You should be asleep. Uh, and the tiredness is kicking in. And so I'm going to use one of my secret hidden moves, which is to actually open the window. Now, it's still pitch black out. Again, it's 5.30. But when the sun starts to rise which all I can see is myself right now. Hello. Um, It doesn't seem to be anywhere close to rising yet, but in a few hours when the sun starts to rise, the blue light will come streaming in, and that should signify to my brain that it's wake-up time, which will be good at least for the meantime in that particular period. In the meantime, for my particular period, I don't really know what to do. I need cocaine because I need a stimulant that only lasts like 40 minutes, um, which I don't have. I don't have any cocaine. God, that would be useful right now, but no, no coke. Um, I do have alcohol. Oh, I want alcohol to be... <sighs> See what I mean? This ain't no joke. This is my life. I wonder if alcohol is even a good idea. I wonder if that will wake me up or if this will just make things worse. Well, fuck it. I'm driving my life 
as far into the ground as possible. We've only got a little bit of vodka left, almost none, in fact. And I think the best use for it would be to make one spicy beer. Um, yeah, I actually don't have... Well, actually, that's not true. I have a whole bottle of whiskey, but it's expensive whiskey, not get-drunk get whiskey. Um I'm gonna open a beer. I just oh hey, here's something. Oh, I was like, what's that sound? It's the beer. Uh, uh, here's something. So I just keep my beers next to my bed, right? And my mom is constantly like, "How can you drink warm beer?" Well, it's not that warm. First of all, it's just room temperature. The glass bottle keeps it cool, right? It's not super hot. In fact, it's relatively cold. But the other thing is, have you not considered the fact that beer was a thing for hundreds of years before refrigeration was a thing? <laughs> like, room temperature beer is just the standard normal way that beer is supposed to be. Cold beers are a new invention and they're actually a marketing phenomenon, right? Because they wanted people, beer, cheap beer makers like cause and stuff wanted to sell their shitty tasting beers um, but no one would drink them because they taste so shit and so they marketed them by t as like oh you need to drink it really cool because when something's really cold you can't really taste it and so you can't taste how it tastes like shit but the whole garden doesn't taste like shit it's quite nice actually so there's no reason to cool it down to the point where I can't taste it um, yeah, God, my brain is getting a little floofy with all this tiredness in it. <clears throat> how I wonder how long this video is. I should have calculated that roughly because I don't know if I'm at the four-hour mark or the half-hour mark. <laughs> I don't think I'm at the four-hour mark, but I did that the other day. The very beginnings of a sunrise. If I want to stay awake, I'm going to need to eat. This often helps if I eat a meal, or not a meal, but just if I eat something, that'll help me wake up. I could have a bagel of some kind or something like that. The problem is, in order to wake up, I have to get out of bed, and I'm too tired to get out of bed, so I'm too tired to wake up. But I need to do it. It's actually been a pretty long time since I've done one of these sort of, you know, just staying up for a longer time than 16 hours or whatever, 16 to 18 hours. It's actually been ages since I've, like, it used to be a scarily regular occurrence that I would stay up for, like, for 36 hours and flip my sleep schedule 180 degrees and for some practicality purpose or because I thought it was fun. Um, I tend to do that when I'm depressed rather than manic, and right now I'm or hypomanic. Right now I'm hypomanic, not depressed. And apparently Lily once showed me a study that sleep deprivation is actually an, like somehow acts as an antidepressant, which is really weird. Like sleep deprivation cures depression, and so apparently I just stumbled upon that somehow, which is why I used to just do it all the time, and it was quite fun. You know, I had some interesting experiences doing that. Don't do it so much anymore these days, or not willingly. It's about practice. But doing it more manic is not very fun. <sighs> because, um, well, I'm not that manic. I'm only just slightly manic. If I was fully manic, it probably would be kind of fun. But I'm not fully manic. I'm only slightly manic. And it's crazy how quickly the paranoia and synchronicity sets in. Like, I'm instantly... I'm only like a few hours later than I would normally have gone to sleep and already I'm seeing things out the corner of my eye and you know looking over my shoulder looking over my shoulder looking over my shoulder and drawing connections between events and people and etc that may not be particularly sane I don't know why I don't know why I, did, I, I mean I'm not completely I'm not saying I'm fucking completely fallen to paranoid delusion or delirium, but it's just interesting how quickly I notice the beginnings of these processes taking root in my brain. It's like they're always there, and sleep is just there to fend them off. It's like that's the natural state of humanity, and so we developed sleep 
in order to like fend off the demons of truth and paranoia. We've got minimum acceptable parameters. About one hour to survive. I mean, obviously, it's one hour and ten minutes. Goal time of one hour and, and 30 minutes, which would be one hour and 40 minutes ish. You know, I'm still awake, but I'm so tired. And look, my new vapor rise. Um, part of me wants us to try and figure this out now, but I am way too tired, I think. I'm really being reasonable about it. It's tempting. Uh, oh, God. It's tempting, but I'm going to just not do that. Oh, wait, turn the light off. God, it's too fucking bright in here. Right, we're trying to sleep now. We're trying to sleep. I'll do that in the morning. This is your last day on earth, old vape. Can you see that? No. There you go. This is your last day on earth, old vape. You'll be gone soon. Join us now and share the software. You'll be free. Hackers, you'll be Join us now and share the software. You'll be free. Hackers, you'll be free. Alright, so I've woken up the next day. I'm not feeling too great. Partially because I just ate a breakfast that was way too heavy. Um, that was a mistake. <laughs> Um, today I'm shaving this guy off and I'm shaving this guy off. We're going full skinhead, probably. Or at least short on the top when we're shaving the beard. Because I'm, I'm, I'm over it. It just gets in the way, collects food and dirt, and it's not great. Look, I like it. It's kind of neat. It's neat to have had it, but I'm over it at this point. Like... It's more hassle than it's worth. Anyway, my vape arrived. Let me show you what we got here. So we got the vape itself, a battery, some coils, and then three flavors. Um, I'll deal with those in a minute. Let's unbox this guy. That is satisfying. This actually looks pretty fucking sick, if I do say so. It, Oh, it's a it's light. Oh, I guess does it have a battery in it? Probably not. That's quite nice. Quite a nice form factor. This is, by the way, the Aspire Mollus. Um, let's see. We got some more stuff in here. Ah, okay. So we... Oh, this is quite nice. So we got coils, a charging cable, um, coils, what else is this? More coils, and more coils. Okay, so... Oh, this is... Why is this one different? I don't know. And I got a bunch in here as well. Alright, so I have to open this fellow up, but I'm not entirely sure how to do so. Oh, okay, that was easy. <laughs> um, Alright, so we got the tank here. This, if I remember correctly, comes out. Um, I don't think I need it to come out. So this is an interesting design, right? This is what the inside looks like. So let me put the battery in. Uh, how the fuck does this open? This is weird. You just... 
There's nothing to like hook onto to get the lid open. Do you squeeze it? No, that can't be right. <laughs> uh, I have absolutely no idea how the fuck to open this. Oh my god, that was a fucking struggle. I finally got it open. I just had to jam something, like, underneath the... Look, I bent my fucking tweezers trying to jam it underneath and lift the lid up. Okay, that was a pain. Alright, let's... Insert the battery. Um... I presume it's this way. Let me see. There's a manual that comes with it. Let me see if it tells me anything. According to the elect- oh, okay, plus, minus. Do I put plus to plus or minus to minus? Okay, well, let's just put it in and hope. Okay, well, turned on, so that's good. Um, Alright, next step is to fill it with liquid. Let's go with this menthol flavor. I don't know why I bought menthol. I've never bought menthol before, but let's go with it. Because fuck it, why not, right? Don't worry, I'm throwing that in my bin, by the way. it's not. I'm not just chucking it on the ground, although that, that would be equally acceptable in the eyes of the law. Alright, let's fill this fella up. This is a very big tank. Which is nice, that means I probably won't have to refill it very often. Okay. So we got that filled up. Um... Let's wait five minutes for the coils to absorb everything. How's this go back on there? Oh, it's magnetic. Oh, that's neat. That's very neat, actually. Oh, and there's a little hole so you can see the display. That's pretty neat. All right, well, let's wait five minutes and then I'll vape from it. All right, let's give this a shot. This is nice. It's like it's like a pack of cards. You can hold it in dealer's grip. It's pretty sick, actually. All right, let's give this a shot. Ooh, hits good, feels good, everything's good. The menthol flavor's a bit much, but that's just a flavor. <sighs> Holy shit, that's pretty intense nicotine, actually. I, I don't know why, I always vape 18 milligrams, but for some... Maybe because this is more than I'm used to coming out of it. I can up and I can up the wattage and stuff on here. I've never had a vape where I can do that. Like, what does this even mean? What does this do? Or lower it. Let me lower it first, just to see what happens. All right, I'll lower it to like. Let's go to like six watts. What happens now? What does this affect? Is it locked? No. Okay, that makes it like incredibly nothing. But if I up it now, let's go to like. Seventeen. <sighs> Clouds. Okay, I understand. This is sick. I'm very happy with this. Okay, you do five clicks to lock it. Same as my old one. And now this piece of fucking dog shit with its fucking bullshit that just comes off all the time. All right. I'm never gonna have to deal with this again. I can throw this bastard away. <sighs> kind of nicked out right now. This is sick. I'm very happy with this. It looks sick. I like this like pattern. I thought it looked kind of cheesy on the website, but it looks better in person. Um, 
I like it. Let me turn the watts back down though, because um, it's a bit. Oh, I have to unlock it. Let me turn it down to 13, because that was good actually. Let me turn it. Yeah. Um, sick. And it's got a USB C charger as well, which is kind of neat. Um, yeah, I'm happy with this. I'm very happy with my purchase. You know who paid for this? Patreon.com forward slash no thank you. So I'm going to shave my beard later today and stuff. And that will be the end of the video. This is actually a really well designed little uh, bit of kit. Right? Like the magnetic covering. That's cool. The little thing with the buttons that lets you adjust the wattage. That's neat. You can take the battery out and everything. Then like refilling it by using this thing that's me i'm not gonna do it because i'll spill vape liquid everywhere and then you can use this little wheel down here by spinning it you can change how like how hard it is to pull from it so if you put it all the way to this end you have to really inhale quite hard but if you pull to this end then you don't have to inhale very hard at all and you can take the entire pod out by like you like push down on it and then there's like a spring and so then you can take this entire thing out i guess for replacing coils and stuff and put it back in, and it all just sort of somehow magically works. Um, it's a little, yeah, it seems pretty good. And I don't know, I'm impressed by the design of this thing. And you can take the battery out easily, everything's neat. Everything just, well, is someone actually put some thought into it. Unlike this piece of shit, which, it, well, I mean, this one's really cheap. It only cost like 15 quid, whereas this one was like 40 quid, so. You would expect there to be a difference, but it's kind of neat. Proposition for an anarchist torrent-based system of exchange. Why did I do this? Widespread in the anti-capitalist milieu is a general expression of lost futures. The systematic war against the human imagination carried out by capitalists and capitalism somehow preventing us from imagining a future significantly different from the present. Capitalist realism, the idea that it is easier to imagine the end of the world than the end of capitalism. In this sense, anarchy is taking that statement as a challenge, so I got to work imagining futures. Anarchism can come in three flavours as related to the last remaining historical meta-narrative, technological progress. 1. Techno-positive, a la transhumanism. 2. Techno-neutral, a la most forms of left anarchism. And 3. Techno-negative, a la primitivism. Yet these positions come with an implicit opposite with regards to nature. If you're techno-negative, you are therefore nature-positive. I stand strongly in the position that any technology sufficiently advanced is indistinguishable from biology. In the same way a loom is a machine that produces weaved cloth, a tree is a machine that produces oxygen, the sugars it needs to sustain itself, etc. A human is a machine that produces desire and so on, this should be obvious. The distinction then comes that technology is a machine specifically created by man. I believe that this is more of a historical blip than a transcendent truth. The age where AI creates its own technology is already here, but we're in the very early stages. Is a genetically engineered being technology or nature? How about if that technology at that genetically engineer that genetic engineering is done via selective breeding rather than gene editing? What if it's performed by aphid farming ants? Anyway, the proposition is flawed from the start, as it assumes man to be an exempt, holy figure somehow necessarily separated from nature. So if these flavours of anarchy all come from the same place but play different language games, what is it they really want? Why place so much emphasis on technology or natural law? The answer is simply that it allows for rules without rulers. I went about thinking of alternative systems of exchange outside of capitalism and currency with rules but no rulers. What is it? My solution is essentially applying a variation of the BitTorrent protocol to non-virtual goods. We can imagine it as a form of market, but also a bit different. The key point is that not everything can be sold on this market. Things which are essential for living, such as basic food, housing and medication, are to be distributed freely outside of this protocol. For example, I could sell some potatoes I've grown via torrent, but only if everyone already has enough potatoes to survive. This could be achieved through communal moderation, similar to CSGO's Overwatch system. If you see something being sold which you think shouldn't be there, then it's reported to a randomly chosen selection of trusted users. 
trusted could be determined by time spent using the protocol, communal verification, or any other number of methods without authority. The idea here is to avoid coercive hierarchy of a moderator class. The vast majority of users would be trusted. This is in place only to prevent botting, who independently anonymously vote on whether it breaks rules. I admit this is the most flimsy part of my system and I'm open to alternative solutions. Imagine I want a new t-shirt. Let's I simply click the tone which opens in the client of my choice. The protocol itself would of course be free libre open source software. This then adds my identity, let's say my IP address, to a database of all the people who want t-shirts. Whenever my IP reaches the top of the database, someone gives me that t-shirt. Think of this in capitalism. If you go to a shop and buy a t-shirt, the seller doesn't then start making a t-shirt in front of you from scratch. They already have t-shirts stockpiled, and you just purchase one that already exists. This, the same applies here. It's not that the goods are made for, to order. So far this seems incredibly simple, so let's get to the key defining feature of this economy. Ratio. Just like with the BitTorrent protocol, your seed to leech ratio is tracked with a simple number. Imagine you start at zero. If you buy leech more than you sell seed, your ratio goes down. If you seed more than you leech, your ratio goes up. The ratio determines your priority in the queue. If you have a very low ratio, but you still want a t-shirt, it's not that you can't afford it. You'll still get it, you just might have to wait a while. Remember that this is taking place in an environment of small federated anarchist communities, so it's not like the databases include millions of people like modern cities. We're talking scales of 50 to 100 here. Importantly, ratios have a decay feature. Over time, your ratio gradually decays back to zero, let's say over the course of six months or a year. If you're thinking, ratio is formalized debt and credit, then decay would break the system. Surely you have to pay back your debts. I suggest you read David Graeber. Decay is weighted towards zero. In a capitalist market, the more currency you have, the easier it becomes to get even more. Ratio is the opposite. The further from zero you go, the exponentially harder you have to push against decay. In this way, we still have a way to reward people who create things that a lot of people want, but we don't end up with a class system or huge wealth disparity. Which problems does this solve? The ratio system solves a particular problem with markets. Imagine a market. Someone is selling a gold chain for $2,000. I want that... I want that gold chain... Uh... I want that gold chain, but I only have $500. Even if no one else wants it, I can't afford it, so in the end, no one gets it. With torrent ratio, no matter how, if my ratio is negative a billion, as long as no one else wants that gold chain, then I can get it no matter what. The seeding system prevents inefficient competition. Rather than 20 people all competing to make their own t-shirts in a zero-sum market, they can all independently provide for the demand, but collaborationally. Of course, this doesn't mean I, as the leecher, can't specify the color of t-shirt I want. It just means that if I want a red t-shirt, anyone who makes red t-shirts can fulfill my request and it benefits everyone. Torrent already works with digital product, whereas capitalism doesn't. We can easily run a perfectly good torrent system without copyright or similar systems of censorship. We already do. Torrent is designed to exist in a society of polymodal exchange. That is to say, there are many systems of exchange coexisting, of which torrent is just one, rather than the current unimodal capitalism or nothing. The deeper problems this solves is the distribution of non-essential materials without hierarchy or currency, but with the advantages of formality not found in pre-civilization fuzzy debt credit systems. This is not a way for, to pay people for their time. Even believing that a person's time is something which can be bought and sold makes no sense in anarchism. Ratio measures production, not the time spent laboring on the product. As I've already explained, ideally you can survive, if not thrive, without ever interacting with Torrent. Torrent is there to mediate exchange of non-essential goods. Please get in contact and critique me wherever possible. One other quick side note onto this imagined future is a biphasic modality of society, where, or a biphasic morphology rather, a, a biphasic social morphology, there we go. So rather than, you know, saying, oh, we're always anarchist and that's it, or oh, we're always authoritarian and that's it, you have a, a society that can flip between a more vertical arrangement and a more horizontal arrangement whenever necessary. And this is not my idea. This is firstly a very, very old idea, but older than civilization, in fact. 
um, but it's also been brought up by neo-reactionaries. However, they get the relationship between authoritarianism and production completely backwards. In their logic, society can flip to an authoritarian mode, quote-unquote, when it needs to get things done. But in, rea in reality, um, vertical hierarchies are incredibly inefficient for getting things done. Uh, the actual operation should be the opposite. When things need to get done, society flips into a horizontal, independent, um, decentralized way uh, modality where people aren't dependent on inefficient bureaucracies, hierarchies, managerial classes to get things done. They can simply do what needs to be done. And then, when everything's all good and no one needs to do anything, you have the problem of resource distribution, and people want to spend time not doing things that are just voting on every single possible thing that goes on in your life. As Yuzik says, if there was some sort of, um, you know, anarchist, syndicalist type of situation with direct democracy, and, you know, they're deciding how to distribute water, I don't care, you know? Just make sure it gets to me, but I don't want to fucking spend ages voting. And um, like, do, do someone else can take care of that. In that situation, then create an, a temporary hierarchy to deal with that. You know, resource allocation, so that most people don't have to do bother with that. That's the best way to do it. Not the other way around. Not the way where you know that stuff is done collectively, which doesn't make much sense. And then this. Um, that, you know, getting stuff done, whatever that really vaguely means, is done hierarchically, which also doesn't make much sense. Flip it the other way around. The hierarchies come to sustain uh, something when, you know, nothing really needs to be, nothing additional needs to be super produced. And the other thing about these hierarchies is there basically needs to be some, and I haven't figured this one out yet, there needs to be a constitution, essentially, and I'm not sure how to do it because um, it would have to be enforced by collective power not state power so the first thing is you take the sort of rojava model where the even if authority, even if there is some sort of centralized authority it never has power over force so the centralized authority would never be given power over the over uh, any sort of military right that's the first and most important thing and the second thing is that there has to be essentially very very strict term limits but in a much more broader sense so for example you could be a um, um you know, elected official to take care of um, water distribution, for example, for two months, and then you're free from that obligation. You no longer have to bother with it. And that stops people from gaining uh, too much power, um, which I, I think is a good way of doing things. The problem is uh, enforcing it. And it could be done by collective power. You know, if someone doesn't leave office, um, in a world where that's, you know, a weird thing not to do, then um, everyone gets pissed off, they all storm his office and hang him or something, you know? <laughs> like, that that works. That, that That is actually a decent way to do things, and we have some evidence that maybe that was how things were done uh, pre-civilization in some situations. Um, you know, it works, but... Uh, there's a question of like for how formal do you want the rules to be do you want them to just be whatever's in you know not necessarily formalized oh you won't you know here autistically you only get four months and 12 days to stay in office before you, or do you want it to just be like when everyone decides you've been in there for too long and they ask you to leave and you don't uh well you're fucked mate like i think the second option is probably better but it's also harder to enforce you know if there's stricter rules the, the idea is of course rules without rulers right and that's one of the things technology is good for. Um, of course, I, I, I refuse to acknowledge the technology-nature distinction. And I'm a strong believer in the idea that any technology sufficiently advanced is indistinguishable from biology. They're just the same thing. Primitivists and, um, you know, cyber futurists just want the same thing. They both want rules without rulers. Primitivists want the rules of nature um, you know, like Linkola, he's always talking about natural law and whatever. And uh, transhumanists, etc., want uh, the, or even libertarians or um, NRXers or Moldberg, all these sorts of people, with like, the, for example, cryptocurrency, where the rule comes from an algorithm, not from a person. Uh, what they don't realize is these are, they both want the exact same thing. Those those are both the exact same thing. Um, and, uh, yeah, I think that's actually a pretty good way of doing things. You just sort of combine the two into one. 
you know, as my talent economy exemplifies. All right, here we go. We cutting the bed, baby. We cutting the bed, baby. We cutting the bed. We cutting the bed, baby. Um, cut the beard. Looks stupid. I'm gonna shave it properly now. Please welcome to the stage, mustache. Thank you. Yeah, what's going on, guys? <laughs> you know what? I just thought, fuck it. You know, I just thought, fuck it. No, I'm not gonna tell. The the one tooth really makes it so much better. The mustache look. Look at me. I look nuts <laughs> in the best possible way. I look like an oil prospector from Texas. Please introduce me. To... Hello there, young lady. It's me, Mustache. The young thank you arise from the future. Mustache, thank you arise for the future. For the story of bitch with my mustache and my missing tooth. Tell me nothing's better than this. Tell me. Tell me nothing's better than this. No one can tell me nothing's better than this. Look at my weak chin. Look at my incel chin. Because I mouth breathed as a child because I always had a blocked nose due to a, a weak immune system from being born via cesarean section. But that was an emergency surgery. So because of my blocked nose due to weak immune system, my chin never fully developed. <laughs> This is my um, pseudo-scientific theory. In reality, it's probably just genetics, but um, <laughs> or whatever. But my pseudo-scientific theory is that it's to do with me mouth breathing as a child because I always had a blocked nose because my immune system was weak because I was born via cesarean section. That's just my guess. That's just my theory. That's completely wrong and unfounded in real life. But that's just my theory, my game theory about my weak chin. My chin isn't that weak. Like it's. It's bad, but it's, it could be worse. I've seen worse people in real life. I've seen worse people on the internet. I've seen certain uh, YouTubers <laughs> with very weak chins. Um, but yeah, I like it, actually. It's not so bad. I don't think... Uh, I'd forgotten what my chin looks like. Yeah. I don't know about the mustache. I'm kind of liking it. I'm kind of liking it. it. Draws more attention to my giant schnoz, which I think is good, because it's my only identifying feature. <laughs> anyway, thanks for watching this video. Um, mustache, thank you. Here to sign it, sign it out.